To understand Mideast newspaper headlines, you have to know about the background, the foundation, which the headlines are based upon. What are these headlines about? They're about the Palestinians, Israel, Iraq. To understand Israel, you have to know something about the Holocaust. That's essential for understanding Israel and the special relationship Israel has with the United States. We could learn about the Holocaust through TV shows, books, newspapers. But look at the quality of the newspaper. Here's a Mideast headline in the San Francisco Chronicle. Israel storms Arafat headquarters. But with so many important things happening in the world, look what the editor chose for the top story of the day. A cheesy humor piece. Son puts mom up for sale on eBay. So let's not use newspapers or TV programs. Instead, let's learn about the Holocaust by getting a book written by a professor. The standard work on the Holocaust is The Destruction of the European Jews by Professor Raoul Hilberg. It comes in three volumes. To the right is the condensed version for students. We'll be using the three-volume version, published in 1985. Here's Raoul Hilberg from the movie Shoah, directed by Claude Landsman. In all of my work, I have never begun by asking the big questions because I was always afraid that I would come up with small answers. And I have preferred, therefore, to address these things which are minutiae or detail in order that I might then be able to put together in a gestalt a picture which, uh, if not an explanation, is at least a description, a more full description of what transpired. On page 1219, there is a table showing the number of deaths broken down into categories. Hilbert put the total Holocaust deaths at 5.1 million. I know you've heard the 6 million number, but Hilbert, having researched the subject for 40 years at the time the book came out, arrived at an estimate of 5.1 million. Hilbert gives a breakdown of the deaths that occurred at the camps. Here we can see that 1 million deaths occurred at Auschwitz. The next three camps, Treblinka, Belzec, and Sobibor, are thought of as their own separate category because they were run so similarly. They are sometimes called the Operation Reinhardt death camps. Together they equal more deaths than Auschwitz, 1.5 million. These three camps equal a little under one-third of the Holocaust, and it's these three camps that we're going to be looking at for the rest of this video. The Operation Reinhardt death camps worked like this. Jews were ordered onto trains. Some were told they were being shipped east, where they would find work. At a point in the journey, they were told that everyone needed to get off at the next stop to transfer to a different train. And due to a typhus epidemic spread by lice, they would also shower and be deloused here. The passengers would step out of the train into a narrow passageway between the train and this building right here, and walk to the left. There were fake signs to make them think they were at a real train station. That white thing there at the end of the building is actually this sign here. Notice the people on the left who have just passed the corner of the building. You'll be able to see them in the distance in the next image. They would gather in a group in this area and then be led through this gate where you see the red arrow. That same gate is in the lower right of this aerial photo. The men would go to their right and the women into the building on their left where they would check in their belongings and strip naked for what they were told would be a shower. The men would walk in this direction to join the women at the entrance to a dirt path known as the tube, a path that led to the gas chamber. This red arrow here is in the same place as this red pointer in this aerial view. Entering this path, they'd walk down here, 
the path taking them around these trees to the entrance of the diesel gas chambers. Sobibor, Belzec, and Treblinka were all run like this. Let's look at a map rather than a model. The main train track line was right here. The train to Treblinka would pull in onto these rails, and the people would get out right here. They would walk along here. That sign I pointed out would have been about right here on the map. So they come into this area, this courtyard, and then they would walk through this gate in the fence. The men would come over here, check in their belongings and strip naked. And the women would go over here and check in their belongings and strip naked. Then they would enter what was called the tube right here. This was the pathway to the gas chamber. Here's a model of the Belzig gas chamber sitting on a wood table. Inside there are six chambers each about the size of a small bedroom. Here's one of the six. You can see a man inside working on removing the dead bodies. A hallway runs down the middle. A room in the very back contained a diesel engine which pumped exhaust into the rooms. You can see the door of that room here. From this view you can see when the gassing was finished, these doors opened upward, similar to garage doors. Here is one of the doors still closed. Notice the wood plank holding it shut. This one is just being opened and you can barely see the body spilling out. And this one is completely open. The bodies were then taken out and thrown into large pits and covered over with dirt when the pits were full. Let's look at a map rather than a model for a moment. We can see the path to the gas chamber. Here's the gas chamber. And here's all the pits where at Treblinka alone an estimated 700,000 bodies were buried. When the killing operation was nearly finished and the bodies lie decaying in mass graves, Heinrich Himmler ordered the camps to dig up the bodies and cremate them. The reason for this was that Germany was losing the war and this territory in Poland would be taken over by the Soviets. Himmler didn't want the Soviets to find the mass graves. So at the three camps, 1.3 million bodies were dug up. During the very end of the killing operations, the bodies were taken directly to the cremation grills. To summarize what we've just learned, Treblinka, Sobibor, and Belzec were all run in the same way. At Treblinka alone, an estimated 700,000 were gassed, buried, later they were dug up and then cremated. 50,000 were gassed and then taken directly to be cremated for a total of 750,000. At all three camps, Treblinka, Sobibor, and Belzec, an estimated 1.3 million were gassed, buried, dug up, then cremated, with an estimated 200,000 gassed and then cremated. Total deaths were 1.5 million, nearly one-third of the whole Holocaust. At the bottom of most every page in Hilberg, there are sources or footnotes. They are in text slightly smaller than the book's text. It's what Hilberg read in order to then write his book. What would happen if we looked at some of these sources? We're going to look at number 63. Yankel Wernick is the author, and his book is called one year in Treblinka. Where can we find this book? Amazon.com doesn't have it. Neither does San Francisco Public Library or San Francisco State University Library. Here on Amazon, no one has ever even reviewed it. It turns out a copy does exist at the University of California at Berkeley. It says, an inmate who escaped tells the day-to-day -day facts of one year of his torturous experience. So finally we get to hear about the Holocaust from someone who was really there. Most Jews who arrived at Treblinka died within the hour. However, a certain number were forced to live there and help with the killing operations. Wernick was one of those until he escaped. Let's see what it says about the process of burning the bodies. Wernick writes, 
Again, the corpses of oldsters, children, women, and men were exhumed. Whenever a grave was opened, a terrible stench polluted the air, as the bodies were in an advanced stage of putrefaction. It turned out that women burned easier than men. Accordingly, corpses of women were used for kindling the fires. But wait a minute, that sounds odd. Does Wernick actually believe that women burn on their own? Like wood? That was page 28, but here on page 29 he essentially says as much. They had to pile the corpses on the grating and set them on fire. 3,000 corpses recently alive burning all at once. But here at a given signal they set the giant torch on fire and it burned with a huge flame. There's no wood mention, there's piles of bodies. He's saying that the bodies themselves burn like a giant torch. And on page 39 he writes, Once the Germans threw some burning object into an open grave to see what would happen, clouds of black smoke began to pour out at once and the fire that started glimmered all day long. In other words, the bodies underground ignited. On the very last page he writes about his escape. He was shot in the shoulder by a Ukrainian guard at close distance. Regarding the bullet, he writes, Believe it or not, the bullet did not wound me. It went through all of my clothing and stopped at my shoulder, leaving a mark. Hmm. He killed the guard with an axe, by the way. Back on page 29, there is a description of the Germans as they burn bodies. Ask yourself if it looks like propaganda or a real eyewitness account. The Germans stood around with satanic smiles on their faces, radiating satisfaction over their foul deeds. They drank toasts with choice liquors, ate, caroused, and enjoyed themselves near the warm fire. Seems a little over the top, doesn't it? Could German soldiers drink while on duty? Could you imagine having an appetite if you were surrounded by thousands of pounds of rotting flesh? Imagine what it would have smelled like there. Would the Germans have really had that demeanor? He later writes, The German fiends stood warming themselves drinking, eating, and singing. At last the fires died down, leaving nothing but ashes. He seems to forget that they'd also leave bones. But anyway. Wernick's vilifying portrayals weren't restricted only to the Nazis. Of a Jewish inmate, he writes on page 37, Another such poor wretch was the so-called privy pit boss, Scheissmeister. He was dressed like a cantor and even had to grow a pointed beard. He wore a large alarm clock on a string around his neck. As no one was permitted to remain in the privy pit longer than three minutes, it was his duty to time everyone entering it. The name of this poor wretch was Julian. He also came from Chestahova where he had been the owner of a metal products factory. Would the German soldiers really have done something this ridiculously theatrical? And whom, owner of a metal products factory? Consider, this book was published by the American representation of the General Jewish Workers' Union of Poland. And on page 12, Wernick writes, I am a carpenter by trade, but for many years I functioned as a member of the examining board of the Warsaw Trades Chamber. So Wernick had apparently worked for a union, and this book was published by a union. It's likely that the hapless Julian in real life was an infamous factory owner who had had a dispute with the union, and was thus portrayed this way in the book. It's clear that this 46-page book, A Year in Treblinka, is a fraud. But how could Wernick have made the mistakes he made? In other words, why couldn't he lie very well? How could somebody not know that bodies don't burn on their own, that bullets that penetrate the clothing aren't likely to stop at the skin? For one, Wernick was born long ago, 1891. At that time, Poland might not have been as modernized as Germany, the United States, or England. Then there's Polish-Yiddish culture. Perhaps it wasn't in some ways as modernized as, say, German-Yiddish culture. Perhaps it was very urban, and thus Wernick didn't know a lot about the country. So we went into the foundations of the Treblinka death camp story by looking up a source in Raoul Hilberg's The Destruction of the European Jews, and we found Yankel Wernick's book, A Year in Treblinka. But it turned out to be a fraud. 
Hilberg cites it as a source five times, by the way. But maybe other Holocaust scholars are more discerning. Let's take Yitzhak Arad. He was the head of Israel's Holocaust Museum, which is called Yad Vashem. This position is likely the most important Holocaust position in the world. He wrote a book called Belzec Sobibor Treblinka, The Operation Reinhardt Death Camps. In addition, he was also a brigadier general in the Israeli army, so he would know about guns, fires, etc. So would he use Wernick's book as a source? The answer is yes. Not only does he use Wernick's book as a source, but mentions him by name on 24 pages. Arad puts his sources in the back of the book instead of at the bottom of each page, like Hilberg. Here is just a single page of his sources. Wernick, 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 Wernick. Wernick, 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 and Wernick. Here's a map of Treblinka on page 39 in Arad's book. Here's the end of the tube. Here's the gas chamber. And here are the burial pits. The problem is that there is a water well right here as you can see on the legend below. The burial pits surround it. That is 700,000 people buried and decaying. At 100 pounds per person, that's 70 million pounds of rotting flesh surrounding this well. The well would have been contaminated. Yet on the day of the inmate escape, they mentioned fetching water here as can be seen on page 289 of Arad's book and on page 292. Granted, the claim is that they had been removing the bodies from the pits, but bodies were still there. We see that on page 280, where Arad writes, During the second half of July, work in the extermination area was close to termination. A sentence later, he writes, More than three quarters of the burial pits in the camp had been opened, and the corpses extracted and cremated. But three-quarters of 700,000 means that there were 175,000 bodies left just two weeks before the supposed August 2nd, 1943 uprising. Plus, on the day of the escape, Arad writes on page 288, The prisoners employed at removing the bodies from the last ditches worked particularly hard that day, so that the number of bodies they brought to the grills was far greater than that morning's cremation capacity. So we know there were lots of bodies all the way up to the last day. Yet we see that getting water from this well was a regular occurrence. On page 289, the former longtime director of Israel's Holocaust Museum, Yitzhak Arad, writes, Every afternoon, two or three prisoners would be allowed out of the barracks area to the well, some 20 meters from the gate in the barracks fence, to fetch water for the barracks kitchen for preparing supper and washing dishes. Here's the Jewish prisoner's barracks area highlighted in green. Here's the fence. And we see the well some 20 meters away, or 65 feet. Thus we saw the barracks area and the well, which is some 20 meters away from the gate in the barracks fence. On the day of the escape, Arad writes, the work of carrying the water was executed slowly that day, and the quantity of water brought to the kitchen was greater than usual. Again, we need to think of the historical demographic of the storytellers. Similar to Yankel Wernick, they were urban, with likely having little formal education. Water wells being largely a rural thing, they had no idea there was a conflict between the mass burial of millions of pounds of bodies and a water well in the middle of that. Let's see this from them. We took benches of fur, cut off, threw on the floor to the side, and about two minutes has to be finished. Not even two minutes. Because there was a line waiting to come up the next week. And that's 
how we worked. Except that's not how it would have worked. If you're going to get off the train and get gassed within the hour and then thrown into a pit, what is the point of a haircut? Here's a photo of a model of Treblinka. So the train comes in here. The people get out here, come into this courtyard, go through this fence. The men go to this side, strip naked, walk over here. The women go to this side, strip naked. Then they go through this path called the tube to the gas chambers here, where they're gassed, killed, and thrown into the outlying pits. Somewhere between the train and the pits for the women, there's a haircut, and that makes no sense. The Germans did shave heads as a life-saving measure to prevent the spread of lice-infected typhus. People like Bomba and Wiernik didn't understand that, so they included in their Treblinka stories. Wernick and Bomba were likely shipped east where they had seen the Germans cutting the hair. So it's included in their stories about Treblinka, but in a way that makes no sense because they didn't understand it. At the Nuremberg trials, there was only one inmate eyewitness representing one-third of the Holocaust. One inmate eyewitness for 1.5 million people. And look how believable his testimony is. His name was Samuel Rosman and claimed to have been at Treblinka. When on the stand at the Nuremberg trials, he was asked why they cut off the women's hair. His reply, according to the ideas of the masters, this hair was to be used in the manufacture of mattresses for German women. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? No men allowed on these mattresses. The judge never even questioned him about it, nor were any human hair mattresses ever found. On page 878, Ral Hilberg writes, Later, all three camps, Sobibor and Treblinka from the start, were equipped with diesel motors. A German who briefly served at Sobibor recalls a 200-horsepower, eight-cylinder engine of a captured Soviet tank, which released a mixture of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide into the gas chambers. And in Yitzhak Arad's book, on page 42, Arad writes regarding Sobibor, a room attached to the building contained a diesel engine, which introduced the poisonous carbon monoxide gas through pipes into the chambers. The problem with this story is that there is hardly any carbon monoxide in diesel exhaust. Diesel exhaust is largely particulate in the form of black soot. There's also a lot of air that goes into the engine, but doesn't react, and then goes out the exhaust pipe as air. So mixed into that black soot is oxygen. And the problem with a regular engine, not a diesel, is that although it produces some carbon monoxide as a waste product to the combustion process, why assume it's the best way to produce carbon monoxide? What you're looking at is the best way to make a car move forward, but not the best way to make carbon monoxide. Similarly, take these two air conditioners. When on, they cool the air and as a byproduct produce some water droplets via condensation. But would they be the best way to produce water? Creating carbon monoxide is a simple chemical reaction. A stream of air passes through a closed bucket of hot coals. The heat makes the oxygen molecules break into individual oxygen atoms. Carbon atoms from the hot coals then bond with the oxygen atoms to make carbon monoxide gas. And carbon monoxide gas in high concentrations is flammable. Here, some innovative people show how simple the process is with items found lying around the backyard. They've taken an old water heater, added some pipes, and to shield the flame, topped it off with a bucket to create a carbon monoxide gas generator. Then they get a lighter and light the gas to prove it's working. The carbon monoxide gas is called wood gas or producer gas. Here is a wood gas generator mounted on a trailer. The canister is filled with wood chip coals 
In this video, we're looking at the black canister on the right. The white water heater is actually resting against the barn. Producing carbon monoxide is a simple process. You don't need all this. And a wood gas generator can produce carbon monoxide in much higher concentrations than this engine. And the Germans would have known that. Here's a list of the Nobel Prize winners in chemistry in the roughly 20 years before the beginning of the war. Here are the Americans, and here are the Germans. Plus, there were half a million of these wood gas generators all over Europe during World War II, mounted on trucks and cars because there was a gasoline shortage and civilian vehicles were being converted to run on wood gas. A search on the web shows that there are a few people that still use these wood gas generators today. They have to be careful though because these wood gas generators produce carbon monoxide at around three times the concentration of regular gasoline engine exhaust and around a hundred times more than diesel exhaust. So when we look at Hilberg on page 878 and see that the poison gas was carbon monoxide coming from a diesel motor, we can see how absurd that is, but even more absurd considering that the engine came from a captured Soviet tank where they'd have no access to an engine manual in German and no easy access to spare parts for an engine with such a critical task. The storytellers assumed that the biggest, smelliest engine would be the one that produced the most deadly gas, but the Germans would have used a wood gas generator. One last thing about carbon monoxide gas. A regular fire produces carbon monoxide gas as well, but it burns up in the fire itself, thus creating the flame of the fire. To do this, the carbon monoxide reacts with more oxygen. With wood gas generators, the carbon monoxide gas is drawn off the coals so it can't react with more oxygen until later. For more information, try a search like this. SFSU Magazine is a twice-yearly publication of San Francisco State University for its alumni, faculty, staff, students, donors, and friends. In this issue, there is a story about how a complete set of the Nuremberg transcripts were donated to the Jewish Studies Department. Professor Mark Dollinger was sitting at his office desk, thoroughly absorbed in preparing lecture notes for his next class, when he got a telephone call that almost made him fall out of his chair. Yes, 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 Dollinger shouted into the phone. Where can I drive right now to pick them up? Educated Americans nearly unanimously believed that the Nuremberg trials thoroughly documented Holocaust crimes. Professor Dollinger articulates this view. This is the most detailed chronology we have of the Nazi atrocities, tens of thousands of pages of personal history. It's a very complete picture of the most horrific moment in modern Jewish history. But would you believe that for the 218-day trial of over 1,000 hours, Treblinka, Belzec, and Sobibor were discussed for only around 20 minutes? We leave San Francisco State University and go to the University of California at Berkeley. Here are the 42 volumes of the 10-month trial known as the Trial of the Major War Criminals by the International Military Tribunal. It doesn't look like a book set because many of the book's spines have been replaced. The first 22 volumes is the court transcript and the other 20 volumes are submitted documents but the tribunal ruled that no submitted documents would be considered evidence unless they were read into the transcript. These 22 volumes have been put on the web by Yale University Law School through a program called the Avalon Project. Here's the 22 volumes. I found that the search engine built into the site doesn't work, so we use Google to search it. We put in Avalon Project as this appears as text on every web page, and this limits the search to Yale University. We then type in the name of one of the three camps, starting with Belzec, the alleged site of 600,000 deaths, and we get one hit in volume 12. The one below this is a duplicate. 
with Command F for Macintosh computers or Control F for Windows computers, we find where the word occurs. The context of this passage is that a member of the British prosecution team, Lieutenant Colonel Griffith Jones, is confronting one of the Germans on trial, Julius Stryker. The English prosecutor is alleging that Stryker knew about the Holocaust during the war via foreign publications, which he must have read and indeed had subscriptions to. Julius Stryker keeps replying that if he had read the reports, he wouldn't have believed them. Referring to a publication called Israeli Teaches Wochenblatt, the English prosecutor says, Many details are also given about the use of poison gas as at Chelm, of electricity in Belzec, of the deportations from Warsaw, the surrounding of blocks of houses, and of the attacks with machine guns. We're interested in the phrase, of electricity in Belzec. What does that mean? In answering that, we find that Carlo Matono, in his book Belzec, tells us of another reference to the Belzec camp, where Belzec is mistakenly referred to as Camp Belsen. We find the reference and learn about the electricity at Belzec. The Soviet prosecutor Lev Smirnov is reading from the official report on German crimes in Poland. Smirnov says, In this same report in the last paragraph on page 136 of the document book, we may read that Camp Belsen was founded in 1940, but it was in 1942 that the special electrical appliances were built in for mass extermination of people. Under the pretext that the people were being led to the bathhouse, the doomed were undressed and then driven to the building where the floor was electrified in a special way. There they were killed. And that's all there is for Belzec at the Nuremberg trial. A description of an electric floor that gets an A plus for diabolical content but a zero for truthfulness. Julius Stryker, by the way, was sentenced to death because he published a magazine that said really mean things about Jews. Now we look to see what was said about Sobibor. We get one hit here. The hit below this is a duplicate, but this is not the International Military Tribunal. This is a later American trial, and Sobibor is mentioned only when listing the other camps. But again, with the help of Carlo Matono's book, we find that Sobibor was mentioned once at the Big Nuremberg trial, but spelled as Sobibur, the misspelling being closer to how it's pronounced. It occurs where Camp Belsen was mentioned. It says that Camp Sobibur was founded during the first and second liquidation of the Jewish ghetto, but the extermination on a large scale in this camp really started at the beginning of 1943. And that's all there is for Sobibor in this 10 month long trial. We now go to Treblinka and get 57 hits, many of which are duplicates and many which mention Treblinka only in passing. On February 25th, we see that the Soviet prosecutor reads an account of a Treblinka survivor named Jacob Vernik. Before I read it, let's try to picture the setting in the courtroom. We read at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum website that in addition to the legal teams and judges, over 400 visitors attended the proceedings each day, as well as 325 correspondents representing 23 different countries. And as this account is read from a Treblinka survivor named Jacob Bernik, be aware of the high-level caliber of this trial with people like Chief U.S. Prosecutor Robert Jackson, handpicked by the President of the United States. Imagine all the Germans on trial listening, and imagine the hushed courtroom, as Soviet Prosecutor Lev Smirnov leans into the microphone and says, This is what Vernik said in presenting a report on Treblinka to the Polish government, a report which, as he stressed in his foreword, was his only reason to continue his pitiful life. Awake or asleep, I see terrible visions of thousands of people calling for help, begging for life and mercy. I have lost my family. I have myself led them to death. I have myself built the death chambers in which they were murdered. I am afraid of everything. 
I fear that everything I have seen is written on my face. An old and broken life is a heavy burden, but I must carry on and live to tell the world what German crimes and barbarism I saw. The problem is that Jacob Vernick is Yankel Wernick. It's just another way to spell and pronounce his name. He is the guy that wrote A Year in Treblinka, where he said a man with a pointy beard and an alarm clock around his neck timed people going to the bathroom, who said that a bullet went through his clothes but didn't pierce his skin. The guard who shot him he valiantly killed with the swing of an axe. Everyone in this solemn courtroom is listening to a passage from Yankel Wernick's book. For Treblinka, Sobibor, and Belzec, the only survivor to testify in person was Samuel Rosman. He testified on the witness stand for around 15 minutes. We're going to read part of the Nuremberg transcript, but first let me explain what the term the president means here. There were four judges, one for the USA, Soviet Union, France, and England. Each had equal voting power, but the English judge, Jeffrey Lawrence, was chosen as the presiding judge, hence president. He controlled the daily operations in the courtroom. Soon after Samuel Rosman begins testifying, there is this exchange. The Soviet prosecutor says to Rosman, I would like you to tell the tribunal what the Germans called the street to the gas chambers. It was named Himmelfart Street. That is to say, the street to heaven? Yes. If it interests the court, I can present a plan of the camp of Treblinka, which I drew up when I was there, and I can point out to the tribunal this street on the plan. I do not think it is necessary to put in a plan of the camp, unless you particularly want to. Yes, I also believe that that is not really necessary. Can you believe that? The only Jewish alleged eyewitness appearing in person representing nearly one-third of the Holocaust tries to present a map. But the presiding judge and the Soviet prosecutor team up to dissuade him from doing so. For the Treblinka, Sobibor, and Belzec camps, the court went mapless, as this was the only map ever offered into evidence. A minute later, Soviet prosecutor Smirnov asks, why was their hair cut off? According to the ideas of the masters, this hair was to be used in the manufacture of mattresses for German women. Right. Had nothing to do with lice, which carried the disease typhus. It was all about human hair mattress stuffing. Rosman even begins lying the minute he hits the witness stand. Here he reads his oath to tell the truth, and then he says, in August 1942, I was taken away from the Warsaw Ghetto. But at the University of California, Berkeley, we find an article Rosman wrote that was included in a United States House of Representatives hearing transcript. Rosman writes on page 121 that on September 17th, he was taken to the train and deported. But at Nuremberg, a year later, he says he was deported in August. It's likely he changed his story after realizing that his September 17th date didn't fit with Warsaw deportation train records, as seen here in Yitzhak Arad's book. Holocaust deniers also believe Jews were deported on these trains, but to camps, not death camps. While we're on this paragraph, notice that he mentions that 90 people were crowded into one cattle car. The idea being the cruelty of treating human beings like cattle. But then he says, in our car, five women and two men had suffocated. The problem is that if you go to any hobby shop and look at models of cattle cars, you'll see that cattle cars have slats. You can't suffocate in one. Rosman was trying to put various propaganda rumors into his own story and mistakenly combined cattle cars with suffocation. On page 122 of the House of Representatives document, Rosman's article states that people were put into cabins with room for 700 to 800 persons. They were then killed by pumping the air out with a machine. Rosman wrote a number of articles like this, which contradicted the established Treblinka story. Due to that, the Soviet prosecutor didn't want his map, 
and was careful not to ask Rosman to go into details about the gas chambers. Instead, Soviet prosecutor Lev Smirnov sets him up to tell a baby-killing story. Perhaps, witness, you can describe this lazarette to the tribunal. This was part of a square which was closed in with a wooden fence. All women, aged persons, and sick children were driven there. At the gates of this lazarette, there was a large red cross flag. Men's, who specialized in the murder of all persons brought to this lazarette, would not let anybody else do this job. There might have been hundreds of persons who wanted to see and know what was in store for them, them being the Jews, but he insisted on carrying out this work by himself. Here is just one example of what was the fate of the children there. A ten-year-old girl was brought to this building from the train with her two-year-old sister. When the elder girl saw that Menz had taken out a revolver to shoot her two-year-old sister, she threw herself upon him, crying out and asking why he wanted to kill her. He did not kill the little sister. He threw her alive into the oven and then killed the elder sister. Rosman likely meant to say he did not shoot the little sister. He threw her alive into the oven and then shot the elder sister. But how could he know this story? He just said that men's would not let anybody do this job. He insisted on carrying out this work by himself, and Samuel Rosman didn't work in the lazarette. He couldn't have seen it himself. Rosman either made it up or heard it from someone else. If he heard it from somebody else, then in legal terms, that's called hearsay evidence and is generally not allowed in a court of law. And yet the presiding judge allows him to tell his hearsay story. Also, in the established Treblinka story, the lazarette has a fire pit, not an oven. The lazarette is the place they would take you if you were too weak to walk all the way to the gas chambers after your 50-mile train ride from Warsaw, according to the story. Keep in mind that the Germans are accused of being baby killers. We happen to be on February 27, 1946, because that's the day Samuel Rosman testified. But while here, let's do a keyword search on BAB to pick up the word baby and babies. And we see an example of another alleged eyewitness describing a German soldier killing a baby and laughing. And if we do a search on children, we see where Soviet prosecutor Lev Smirnov asks yet another alleged witness from Auschwitz the following. Tell me please witness. Were you an eyewitness of German SS men's attitude toward children? She replies, yes. After many questions, Smirnov asks, Were they thrown into the ovens alive or were they killed by other means before they were burned? The children were thrown in alive. But consider that Raoul Hilbert doesn't mention children being thrown alive into fires in his three-volume The Destruction of the European Jews and neither does the Auschwitz entry at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. In other words, even Holocaust historians don't believe that happened. Considering that, notice how the lawyers supposedly representing the Germans always waive their right to cross-examine these alleged witnesses. A good lawyer could have exposed all the lies I've pointed out. Yet here's an example of what I've always found when I've read the transcript. The witness accusing the Germans of killing babies by throwing them alive into a fire finishes testifying and the president asks, do any of the defendants counsel wish to ask any questions? There was no response. And the judge continues, then the witness can retire. At the end of Rosman's article in the U.S. House of Representatives document, he mentions how many people were killed at Treblinka. First take note that in Raoul Hilberg's book, The Destruction of the European Jews, Hilberg estimates the number killed at Treblinka as up to 750,000. Samuel Rosman, however, has a much higher number. The number of Jews were, from Germany, about 120,000, from Austria, 40,000, from Poland, 1.5 million, from Czechoslovakia, 100,000, from Bulgaria, 14,000. From Russia, 1 million. Total, 
2,774,000. Hmm, someone is off by 2 million, either Raoul Hilberg or Samuel Rosman. But this, and the pumping air out of the chamber, and suffocating in a cattle car, and 800 people per bedroom-sized chamber, doesn't keep Hilberg from using Rosman's article as a source. Hilberg writes in his book, The Destruction of the European Jews, that when Jews arrived at Treblinka, some suffered nervous shock, laughing and crying alternately. And the little 61 here on page 972 is the source. It is Rosman's article that we've been looking at. Hilberg's modus operandi seems to be this. If you can find a believable paragraph in an otherwise fraudulent article, use it. There was one other person who made substantial comments about Treblinka at the Nuremberg trial. He was the head of the Auschwitz concentration camp. His name was Rudolf Hus. His testimony was of course mainly about Auschwitz, but he said some things about Treblinka as well. When he testified, there were two people in the courtroom with similar names, Rudolf Hus and a Rudolf Hess. Both names have multiple spellings. Let's clarify for a moment who each one is. Rudolf Hess was at one time the second in command in Nazi Germany, just under Adolf Hitler. In 1941, Hess did something very crazy. In a desperate attempt to keep Western Europe from being plunged into war, he piloted a plane by himself to England. In an attempt to go around Winston Churchill and make contact with England's peace factions. When the plane was flying over England, he got out of the pilot's seat, put on a parachute for the first time in his life, and jumped out of the plane. Spraining his ankle upon landing in a field, he was caught and promptly arrested. After the war, the English sent him to Nuremberg to be tried as a major war criminal. He was sentenced to life in prison, and spent the next 40 years in the strangely cruel environment of Spandau prison where, for instance, guards were instructed to never call him by his actual name. He was never allowed to hug or touch his son ever again, nor was he ever allowed a single moment alone with him. Hess died at 92 years old after 40 years in that environment. Rudolf Hus is the one we are looking at, though. He was the camp commander of Auschwitz. While at the prison in Nuremberg, Hus signed a confession, and when he was on the witness stand, his confession was read to him by American Assistant Prosecutor Colonel John Amon. Amon was a prosecutor, but he had another position at Nuremberg as well. He was the head of interrogations. After Hus appeared at Nuremberg as a witness, he was then turned over to the Polish government and executed a year later. So picture this moment at the Nuremberg trial. Hus is on the witness stand listening to the head of interrogations, Colonel Amon, read his own confession to him. Colonel Amon says, I commanded Auschwitz until 1st of December 1943 and estimate that at least 2,500,000 victims were executed and exterminated there by gassing and burning, and at least another half million succumbed to starvation and disease, making a total dead of about 3 million. Colonel Amon reads some more of the confession and then says, That is all true, witness? Yes, it is. The problem is that if we go to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum website and look up Auschwitz, it states, it is estimated that the SS and police deported at a minimum 1.3 million people to Auschwitz complex between 1940 and 1945. Of these, the camp authorities murdered 1.1 million. And when they say murdered, they are including the disease and starvation deaths. So the Auschwitz Museum website says 1.1 million were killed, and yet Hus confessed to 3 million. Strange that he would do that, isn't it? For the next passage in the Nuremberg transcript, we need to know what the term general government here means. It was an area of Poland occupied by Germany. We look at what Hus said about Treblinka. Colonel Amon continues reading the confession. The final solution of the Jewish question meant the complete extermination of all Jews in Europe. I was ordered to establish extermination facilities at Auschwitz in June 1941. At that time, there were already in the general government 
three other extermination camps, Belzec, Treblinka, and Wolzec. Hus has thrown out a fake name, Wolzec, a city that doesn't exist. He puts it in the place of Sobibor. It was likely an intentional mistake. Hus knew that the interrogators didn't know enough about the subject to call him on it. Notice that Hus says that in June 1941, there were already in the general government three other extermination camps. But if we look at Yitzhak Arad's book, we see that they hadn't even started building any of the camps at that time. On page 24, we read when they began the first camp, Belzec. The construction of the death camp began on November 1st, 1941. You can pause the video and look at them side by side. Then the confession states, I visited Treblinka to find out how they carried out their exterminations. The camp commandant at Treblinka told me that he had liquidated 80,000 in the course of one half year. He was principally concerned with liquidating all the Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto. He used monoxide gas, and I did not think that his methods were very efficient. So when I set up the extermination building at Auschwitz, I used Cyclone B, which was a crystallized prussic acid, which we dropped into the death chamber from a small opening. But let me paraphrase and expound on what he just said. He basically said, Treblinka was using a gas that wasn't really that deadly, so I decided to use a deadly gas instead. Can you imagine the Germans using two totally different gases for the same job? One you take a whiff of and have cyanide in your lungs, and the other you take a whiff of on any busy street. Back to Hu's confession read by Colonel Amen. Another improvement we made over Treblinka was that we built our gas chamber to accommodate 2,000 people at one time, whereas at Treblinka their 10 chambers only accommodated 200 people each. But that's like saying this. The Treblinka people didn't seem to have their thinking caps on when they combined millions of deaths and bedroom-sized chambers, so I put big chambers. The confession later says, Still, another improvement we made over Treblinka was that at Treblinka the victims almost always knew they were going to be exterminated, and at Auschwitz we endeavored to fool the victims into thinking that they were going to go through a delousing process. Not only is that not true according to the established story, but it's like saying this, Treblinka would never believe this, but people are way more willing to step into what they think is a shower as opposed to what they think is a gas chamber. And that's all that Hus said about Treblinka. So we've seen what was said about nearly one-third of the Holocaust at Nuremberg. Not much. Around 20 minutes were spent, and here's a breakdown of that. That it was only 20 minutes is shocking enough, but even more shocking is how many lies were packed into that 20 minutes. We read what Professor Mark Dollinger said again, and we see that for around one-third of the Holocaust at least, what he says isn't true at all. This article can be found on the web here. This is the most detailed chronology we have of the Nazi atrocities, tens of thousands of pages of personal history. It's a very complete picture of the most horrific moment in modern Jewish history. You know, when I first bought this tape at 17, I couldn't really relate to the title because power corruption and lies weren't really part of my world. I feel for any team that has to bear the burden. This realization. It's important to remember it's not about fighting. It's about joy and love and putting forth good energy. Here's a model of the gas chamber. At Treblinka alone, 750,000 allegedly died in a building like this over a period of roughly six months. To put it in perspective, a large university has 30,000 students. The amount of people that went through this building is 25 times that. You'd think that would at least warrant a double door right here. And entering a hallway first? Why design it like that? And then to take a hard right turn and go into a gas chamber the size of a medium-sized bedroom? How about these design changes? 
Scrap the hallway. Get rid of these wall partitions. Make it into two large chambers, one here and one here. Put a set of double doors here and a set of double doors here. Make it on ground level, no stairway. You could have guards out here and here rather than here in this five foot wide hallway where the guards would have to put their backs against the wall and press their guns to their chest just to let people get by while a guard down here trying to get people into this room has to deal with the specter that a surge of people will throw him against this wall. Lastly, make the building bigger so that it could hold 2,000 people, which is the amount of people that would come into the camp in one transport. The model we've been looking at is the second gas chamber design for the three camps. Previously, Belzic, Sobibor, and Treblinka had three-room gas chambers. Hilberg writes on page 879, massive structures, well hardly massive structures as we've seen, of stone in Belzic and brick in Treblinka containing at least six gas chambers in each camp replaced the old facilities. In the new gas buildings, the chambers were aligned on both sides of a corridor, and at Treblinka the engine room was situated at its far end. And in a footnote at the bottom of this page, Hilberg writes, Information about the number and size of gas chambers in each camp rests not on documentation, but on recollection of witnesses. He goes on to write, It is likely that each facility was designed from the same basic plan, hence three is probably the initial capacity and six the subsequent one. Below this, coincidentally, is the ever-present Yankel Wernick. And Yitzhak Arad writes on page 119 of his book, The new gas chambers that had been built in Belzec in June-July 1942 served as a model in the other two camps. So this design, and all the problems that have been pointed out with it, is supposedly the culmination of a lot of testing and experience. Hard to believe, isn't it? As it turns out, the population of San Francisco is the same as the amount of people gassed in this building at Treblinka. Both are roughly 750,000. Here's a map of San Francisco. See the flashing purple line on the right? That is Market Street. Here's a video of just part of San Francisco. The purple line there is Market Street. So what they're saying is that the numerical equivalent to everyone in this city ascended that three and a half foot wide stairway, went into that narrow hall, and then went into one of the six bedroom sized gas chambers. But as you look at this expanse of San Francisco, keep in mind the big picture that according to the story, all these people were gassed, then buried, Later they were dug up and cremated on outdoor fires. It's kind of hard to believe, isn't it? And this panorama from Twin Peaks only showed about one third of the city. Abraham Bamba in the movie Shoah by Claude Landsman claimed that they cut hair in the gas chambers as well. We know the Germans shaved heads to prevent lice and typhus, but truth being the first casualty of war, combined with cultural misunderstanding, led linguistically to the term shaving the head, becoming cutting the hair, which then turned into haircut. So turned around completely, this life-saving measure is now something that they do to you in a gas chamber before killing you. Abraham, can you tell me how did it happen? How were you chosen? There came an order from the Germans to take out the barbers they could get. And they need them for a certain job. And we got it together. Professional, Barbara. Official, yes. 
We gathered together and we're waiting for the order. And the order came to go with them, with the Germans. They took us in to the guest chamber. Going up in over there, they put in some benches where the women could sit and not to have the idea that this is the last way or that is the last time they're going to live or they're going to breed or they're going to know what is going on. How long did it last that the barbers cut the hair inside the gas chamber? Because it was not always the case. We worked inside the gas chamber for about a week or 10 days. After that, they decided that we will cut the hair in the undressing barrack. As if the Germans would have ever chosen the gas chamber as the place to give the haircut in the first place. How did it look, the gas chamber? It was a room, not a big room. The room was, I would say, the size by feet, around 12 by 12. He just said the size by feet, around 12 by 12. 12 feet is 3.6 meters. That's the size of a medium-sized bedroom. Let's hear it again. How did it look, the gas chamber? It was a room, not a big room. The room was, I would say, the size by feet, around 12 by 12. But in that room, they pushed in a lot of women, almost one on top of the other one. But like I mentioned before, when we came in, we didn't know that what, what we're going to do. And then one of the couples that came in, he said, Barbers, you have to do a job to make to believe all those women that came in that they're just taking a haircut and going in to take a shower. And from there, they go out from this place. Excuse me, how did it happen when the woman came and entered the gas chamber? Were you yourself already in the gas chamber or did in you the, in, in, I, I said, we were already in the gas chamber. Because we were waiting over there for the transport to come in. Let's find out how many people were in this room. The imagination that they're getting a nice haircut. There were no mirrors, no? No, there were no mirrors, there were just benches, not chairs, but just benches, where we worked about 16, 17 barbers. You said that you were 16 barbers? Uh, yes. About. This means you cut the hair of how many women in one batch? In one patch, there was about, I would say, going into that place between 60 and 70 women in the same room at one time. And afterwards, the doors of the gas chamber after, were after that, we were finished with this party. Another party came in and it was around about 140, 150 women. So we have 16 barbers with 16 benches, 150 women, and we'll estimate the number of guards inside the room at three. That is 169 people. Try to imagine 169 people in that room outlined in red. And when all 169 were in there, 70 of them proceeded to get a haircut by taking turns sitting on 16 benches. I have another question. Why do they need the hair? To take off as much hair as we could because they needed the woman's hair to be transported to Germany. This means that you didn't shave them. No, we did not shave. We just cut the hair, make the believe that they're getting a nice haircut. But you cut with what? With scissors? With scissors, yes. With scissors and we comb, without any clippers. Abraham Bomba claims he was cutting hair in the camps in 1942. 
Here's a map of Europe in 1942 from the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. As you can see, Germany is occupying the Soviet Union all the way to Moscow and occupying most of France as well as Denmark and Norway. Do you really think they would need human hair? If they need insulation material, why not just get wool from sheep in the whole area they control? Or why not ask some of the barbers in this giant region to save their hair clippings? There's already a bottleneck in the operation because you're trying to kill thousands of people a day in several bedroom-sized rooms. Why further complicate the process by giving thousands of haircuts a day? Next, Abraham Bamba tells what happened when they were finished cutting the hair. They told us to leave the gas chamber for a few minutes, about five minutes, where they put in the gas and they chucked them to death. Where did you wait? Outside the gas chamber. First of all, it would take longer than five minutes to, as Bamba says, choke them to death. But secondly, Every other chamber would have had barbers too, so did a hundred barbers suddenly flood into this hallway? And does Bamba even know there's supposed to be a hallway? Let's look at it again. They told us to leave the gas chamber for a few minutes, about five minutes, where they put in the gas and they choked them to death. Where did you wait? Outside the gas chamber. And on the other side, where on this side the woman went in, and the other side was a group working people, which they took out already the dead bodies. Some of them, they were not exactly dead. They took him out, and in two minutes, not even two minutes, in one minute everything was clear. And it was clean to take in the other party of the other woman to go through the same thing what the first one they went through. He's confusing the time it took to give one haircut with the time it would take to haul out 15,000 pounds of bodies from one chamber. In fact, it's the same phrase he used in an interview around 15 years later. 150 women at 100 pounds each, which is 45 kilograms, is 15,000 pounds for that one room. Plus, they'd have to clear out the other five rooms as well before they can do another gassing. Compare the following three excerpts. Every haircut, it took about two minutes. From them, we took benches of hair, cut off, threw on the floor to the side. In about two minutes, has to be finished. Not even two minutes. Of them, they were not exactly dead. They took him out and in two minutes, not even two minutes, in one minute everything was clear. And it was clean. You might not believe Bamba, but would the emotional pull of a really sad story change your mind and make you believe him? As a matter of fact, I want to tell you something what it happened. At the guest chamber, when I was chosen in over there to work as a barber, some of women that came in from a transport from my town from Transtohova. And from the women, from the number of women, I know a lot of people. You knew them? I know them. I live with them in my town. I live with them in my street. And I was, some of them, they were my close friends. And when they saw me, all of them started hugging me. Abe, hey, this and that, what are you doing here? What's going to help me with us? What could you tell them? What could you tell a friend of mine? He worked as a barber. He was also a good barber in my hometown. When his wife and his sister came into the guest chamber, Okay, go ahead. 
that's what he answered. When his wife and the sister came. They tried to talk to him and the husband. Also from his sister. They could not tell them that is the last time they stay alive. Because behind them was the German Nazis, the SS men. And they knew the minute they will say a word, not only the wife and the woman, which they are dead already, but also they will share the same part with them. But in a way, they try to do the best for them, to stay with them a second longer, a minute longer, just to hug them and just to kiss them, because they know they will never see them again. It's amazing what people will believe if evil is in the equation. Regarding Bamba, one might say the following. Well, anyone can find a random, obscure, supposed eyewitness who says crazy things. One could go to New York and find some supposed eyewitness who says something unbelievable about the World Trade Center. That doesn't mean the World Trade Center towers didn't come down. But did we choose an obscure eyewitness? Consider that while watching the following. Here is the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum website. If we go down and click on the Holocaust Encyclopedia and type in Treblinka and click on the first article that comes up, we can see the Treblinka webpage. And here's a link to Bomba's videos from an interview later in his life. It's not a long article, as you can see. So if you go back and click on personal stories, you can see that at the time this was made in autumn 2005, that Bomba is the featured eyewitness for Treblinka. The point being that I featured the main witness that they feature. The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum features a guy that claims that, for a time, the Nazis disguised the gas chambers as a kind of hair salon, complete with professional barbers, in order to surreptitiously obtain precious human hair clippings. Eliyahu Rosenberg was an alleged Treblinka survivor. This is a video still of him testifying at the 1961 Adolf Eichmann trial in Jerusalem, where Eichmann was sentenced to death. Here's Rosenberg 26 years later in 1987, testifying at the John Demyanyuk trial in Jerusalem. The pictures on the back of the wall behind the three sitting judges are not photos of Treblinka. They are photos of a model of Treblinka made by Yankel Wernick the guy that wrote this book. Watch the 1961 trial footage, keeping in mind what you know about the size of the individual gas chambers and what you know about diesel exhaust. The efficient method of murder was gas. The place, large gas chambers. Eliyahu Rosenberg witnessed the system at Treblinka. Did you see the whole process of extermination? Yes, I saw the whole process. Will you describe to the court briefly? The people arrived from that famous Judenstrasse, which led from one camp number one to camp number two. There they were, SS men were posted there, all the staff of camp two. They had dogs, whips, they had bayonets in their hands. The people walked calmly at first, of course, in 1942, in the summer. They did not know where they were being led. And when they entered the gas chambers, 
Twitter. They stood near the entrance, and there were two Ukrainians near the entrance. One was Ivan, the other one was Nikolai, and they opened the gas. Where did the gas come from? The gas came from a diesel engine. Yes, from an engine. From an engine, or was it brought from the outside, the gas? No, it was Ropa gas. It was called Ropa. It was being manufactured by a diesel motor. Yes, they put Ropa inside. Ropa is a kind of a solar or, or yes, solar oil. And the fumes came out of a pipe which led into the gas chambers. And when the people entered into the gas chambers, the last ones were stabbed in their bodies by the bayonets which were held by these and the last people already saw what was happening they did not want to enter and they just jammed the people inside 400 into the smaller chamber and when they stabbed them the people just automatically of themselves were pushed inside and this formed the uh, the uh, this was the final capacity, the full capacity of the gas chamber, and it was so jam-packed that it was difficult to close the door. And when they locked the door, we were on the outside, we heard only screams and Shema Israel prayers, mother, father, and after 35 minutes they were dead. And two Germans were standing, and they said, everyone is asleep. Open the doors. And we opened the doors and we took the bodies out. As in the 1987 trial, so also in 1961. This is also a photo of Yankel Wiernik's model in the background. The Eichmann trial footage was found on this program. Yitzhak Arad and Raoul Hilberg both mention a curtain that hung at the entrance of the hallway of the gas chamber building. Arad writes on page 120, The entrance to the corridor was covered by a dark Jewish ceremonial curtain taken from an unidentified synagogue. On it was inscribed in Hebrew, This is the gateway to God. Righteous men will pass through. By the way, there's the ever-present Yankel Warnick on the same page. It's odd that the camp administrators would procure a curtain from a synagogue and install it at the entrance of a gas chamber building disguised as a bathhouse. So why is the curtain part of the story? We might find the answer in Reader's Digest of all places. In February 1943, the usual millions of copies were dropped in rural, small town, and suburban mailboxes all over the United States. You get an idea of what the magazine was like by a sampling of the article titles such as Vivas for Jorge Washington and Even Soda Pop Goes to War. At the time, Reader's Digest had the highest circulation of any magazine in the world. The issue had an article called Remember Us. It said on page 107 that by the end of the war, the Jews of Europe would be reduced from a minority to a phantom. In other words, there would be hardly any left. The author puts out a number. Six million. That's quite a prediction considering this is in the middle of the war and that the main chambers at Auschwitz were still under construction. In Hilberg's book on page 885, we see that at the time, the main chambers at Auschwitz hadn't even been finished being built. So was the writer an investigative reporter stationed in Europe with access to good information, or a high up government official? Actually, the writer was a Jewish Hollywood script writer named Ben Hecht. His internet movie database entry is huge. This story in Reader's Digest brought the Holocaust story to the heartland of America for the first time, but his information includes incidences that never happened. Incidences that even Raoul Hilberg doesn't believe ever happened, the first three of which mention synagogues. 
This is the first incident Hecht gives. Remember us, in the town of Freiburg, in the Black Forest, two hundred of us were hanged and left dangling out of our kitchen windows to watch our synagogue burn and our rabbi being flogged to death. Here's the second example given by Hecht. In Sushin, in Poland, on the morning of September 23rd, which is the day set aside for our atonement, we were in our synagogue, praying God to forgive us. All our village was there. Above our prayers, we heard the sound of motor lorries. They stopped in front of our synagogue. The Germans tumbled out of them, torches in hand, and set fire to us. When we ran out of the flames, they turned machine guns on us. They seized our women and undressed them and made them run naked through the marketplace before their whips. All of us were killed before our atonement was done. Remember us. His third example, this is all on page 108. In Roklawek, also the Germans came when we were at worship. They tore the prayer shawls from our heads. Under whips and bayonets, they made us use our prayer shawls as mops to clean out German latrines. We were all dead when the sun set. Remember us. Even Raoul Hilberg doesn't believe these things happened. If you look up every reference to synagogues seen on page 1269 of Hilberg's three-volume Destruction of the European Jews, he only mentions civilian mobs burning synagogues in 1938 with no one trapped inside. But propaganda involving synagogue desecration had an effect on middle America in such a way as to make Americans pro-war. Or imagine a young airman involved with the bombing of a German residential suburb who felt it justified. He'd read the Reader's Digest article. So when we read about the synagogue curtain at the entrance to the gas chamber, what we may be seeing is an ill-fitting vestige of a certain type of war propaganda of the sort that involves desecration of synagogues. But in this article we also see that a Hollywood scriptwriter predicted the six million deaths in the middle of the war. That's interesting. How could someone mention six million Jews in the middle of the war? Hecht writes, of these six million Jews, almost a third have already been massacred by the Germans, Romanians, and Hungarians, and the most conservative of the scorekeepers estimate that before the war ends, at least another third will have been done to death. If the most conservative estimate is that two-thirds will die, one could posit that the most liberal estimate would be that all six million will die, which might be why he writes that the Jews of Europe will have been reduced from a minority to a phantom. Ben Heck got the six million number by taking the Jewish populations of various European countries and adding them up. It would seem that that would make sense. After all, if you knew the Jewish population of those countries, and if you feared that all would be killed, then you could just add up the numbers and predict how many would be killed and thus come up with six million. But here's the first problem with that. Hecht doesn't include enough countries. Hecht mentions eight countries, which he tabulates to get six million. In contrast, Raoul Hilberg tabulates 17 countries on page 1048 and gets around 9 million. Here's problem two. According to Raoul Hilberg, Ben Hecht's pre-war Jewish population figures are not correct. Hecht gives the pre-war German Jewish population at 900,000, whereas Hilberg has it at 240,000. Hecht puts the pre-war Jewish population of Hungary at 750,000, whereas Hilberg puts it at 400,000. And Hecht's pre-war Jewish population for Czechoslovakia, 150,000, but Hilbert puts it at 315,000. Our third problem with Hecht's tabulation is that, according to Hilbert, all the Jews weren't killed. Some fled, some weren't rounded up, some hid, some emigrated, some left and then returned. For instance, for the 400,000 Jews in Hungary, 200,000 were still left after the war. For the 240,000 Jews in Germany, 80,000 were still there after the war. For the 270,000 Jews in France, 200,000 still remained after the war. So Hecht uses all sorts of wrong information and methodology, yet his article, which first brought the Holocaust story to mainstream America, also has the six million number in it. 
Hecht was part of a militant Jewish organization called the Ergen. In fact, when the Germans lost the war, Hecht then turned his writing skills toward the British in Palestine. At the Wyman Institute website, we see that Hecht wrote a play called A Flag is Born, the purpose of which was to stir up anti-English sentiment in America and raise money for the Jewish fighters in Palestine. We read, in the play's dramatic final moments, David delivers a stirring Zionist speech and marches off to fight for Jewish freedom in the Holy Land, holding a makeshift Zionist flag fashioned from Tevye's prayer shawl. There's the prayer shawl again, just like in the Reader's Digest article. And by the way, in the play, the character David is a Treblinka survivor. He is the one that held the makeshift Zionist flag fashioned from a prayer shawl. His role was played by Marlon Brando. Hecht even took out anti-English advertisements in newspapers. He wrote in one such ad excerpted at the Wyman Institute website, In the past 1500 years, every nation of Europe has taken a crack at the Jews, Hecht wrote. This time, the British are at bat. You, referring to the Jews fighting the British in Palestine, are the first answer that makes sense to the New World. Every time you blow up a British arsenal, or wreck a British jail, or send a British railroad train sky high, or rob a British bank, or let go with your bombs at the British betrayers and invaders of your homeland, the Jews of America make a little holiday in their hearts. When the English conflict was over, he turned his writing and theatric skills toward the Jewish-Israeli government, if you can believe that because they had not taken as much Arab land as Hecht would have liked. When the Ergen, the group Hecht was part of, tried to bring a ship full of weapons into Israel in 1948 to be used on the Arabs, the new Israeli government sunk the ship, which was called the Alta Lina. Hecht later wrote about this incident in a lamenting style strangely similar to the Reader's Digest article. The Jewish government had called for the Ergen to help it stay alive against five enemy armies, but they would never dare welcome an Altalina loaded with enough arms to rescue beleaguered Jerusalem or to enable an army of victorious young Hebrews to sweep through Eretz Israel and win land on both sides of the Jordan. There would be no Hebrew nation, no room for cattle and grain, no cities, no freight yards, no ancient capital revived, no space for industry or destiny. There would be a beachhead called Israel, to which the Jews could cling, as they had always clung, like castaways. In short, the people of Middle America trusted publications like Reader's Digest. The vast majority did not have the skepticism and discernment to question it or writers as clever as Hecht. And the six million number? That was the number thrown out by the storytellers before the supposed fact happened. We'll look at two problems regarding airflow in the gas chambers. First, the gas chambers are described as having a very low ceiling. On page 74 of Arad, we see the testimony of Belzec escapee Rudolf Reeder, who says that the ceiling was just two meters high, which is six and a half feet. The problem with that height is that everything is within reach of the people inside the chamber. They could block the pipe that pours exhaust into the room by pushing their hands against the opening, or by stuffing a towel into the pipe since it's often claimed they were given towels. The second problem is that if you have a pipe pouring exhaust into a hermetically sealed room, you also need another pipe to let the air that's already in the room escape. Yet nowhere in Arad or Hilberg could I ever find a mention of a second pipe. Ironically, the one person to mention a second pipe is Yankel Wernick in his book a year in Treblinka on page 14. Notice the words inlet and outlet for flushing out the fresh air. I almost found the presence of two pipes mentioned in Arad. He mentions an early test gassing of the insane on page 10. Two doctors are involved. Dr. Widman of the criminal police who consults Dr. Heese, director of the Criminal Police Technological Institute. And here's how they do it. In the local lunatic asylum, a room with 20 to 30 of the insane was closed hermetically, and two pipes were driven into the wall. This looks correct, one to let the exhaust in, and one to let the air that's already in the room out. But watch what happens at the end. After eight minutes, the people in the room were still alive. 
A second car was connected to the other pipe in the wall. The two cars were operated simultaneously, and a few minutes later all those in the room were dead. So much for physics. They block their outtake pipe, which is necessary for the experiment to work properly. The storytellers figured that two intake pipes would work better than one outtake pipe and one intake pipe. The storytellers are good at vilifying the Germans, but not so good with physics, chemistry, and common sense, which is revealed with the experiments that they claim the Germans conducted. Here's one just above on the same page, and it's really ridiculous. Dr. Widman and Arthur Nieb are investigating the possibility of killing millions of Jews with explosives. Here's their experiment. Twenty-five mentally ill people were locked into two bunkers in a forest outside Minsk. The first explosion killed only some of them, and it took much time and trouble until the second explosion killed the rest. Explosives, therefore, were unsatisfactory. Yeah, especially considering that the explosions would take a toll on the bunker as well, or blow it up. And imagine the mess. And another hint that this is a made-up story from someone who doesn't know what they're talking about, the amount of explosives they brought with them. 400 kilograms, which is nearly 900 pounds. And historian Raoul Hilberg believes this story too. It's on page 333 of his book. Here's an experiment to get rid of tens of thousands of bodies. Just open the pit and throw an incendiary bomb on top of the bodies. That should make them all disappear. Such is the hypothesis of the experiment. We read in Arad on page 171, The pits were opened and the first experiments were carried out. Incendiary bombs were tried, but these caused large fires in the surrounding woods. Hmm, multiple large fires in the surrounding woods. Okay. Hilbert believes this too on page 977 of his book. After a gassing, all the bodies would first be hauled out of the rooms into a pile just outside the building. From there they would be hauled to the outlying burial pits. We can see in Arad that on some days 12,000 people were gassed in this building at Treblinka. At 100 pounds each, which is 45 kilos, that is 1,200,000 pounds of bodies to be hauled to the pits in just one day, or 544,000 kilos. Now consider that during the war, Germany was the only country to have operational jet aircraft and was miles beyond any country in rocket science. Considering that, what mechanized industrial process did they use to haul these daily million pounds of bodies to the pits? Well, the prisoners dragged the bodies by their feet to the ditches. That's a rad, page 87. Or the Germans fixed upon stretchers as the fastest way. Two men carried the stretcher which looked like a ladder with leather carrying straps. That's a rad page 111. Or we can look in Yankel Wernick's book, page 10. He says that the work was hard because we had to drag a corpse in teams of two for a distance of approximately a quarter of a mile. That's 402 meters. At times we tied ropes around the dead bodies to pull them to their graves. So we're supposed to believe that the country that came up with the first operational jet aircraft decides upon design solutions for Treblinka that predate the invention of the wheel. What we're really seeing is the recurring theme of the storytellers thinking they know how the Germans would have done it. In other words, Wernick and others figured they knew how the German industrial engineers would have set things up. At Treblinka, Belzec, and Sobibor, an estimated 1.38 million bodies were allegedly buried underground. The problem is that there isn't enough burial space on the maps and models for that many bodies. To show this, we'll figure out how much space one body would take. Then we'll multiply that number by 1.38 million. That will give us the total space needed to bury all the bodies. Keep this 3D image in mind as we look at page 112 in Yitzhak Arad's book, which is called Belzec Sobibor Treblinka. After the victims' bodies were thrown into a pit by the body transport workers, the corpses were arranged in rows by the burial detail. To save space, 
the bodies were arranged head to foot. Each head lay between the feet of two other corpses, and each pair of feet between two heads. Sand or chlorine was scattered between the layers of bodies. Approximately half the team worked inside the ditches arranging the corpses at the same time that the other half was covering a layer of bodies with sand. When a ditch filled up, it was topped off with earth and a new ditch was opened. Arad is saying that each layer looked something like this configuration. To estimate how much space one body would take, we'll choose an average height of 5 feet per person, or 1.52 meters. This height would account for men, women, and children, but notice that the head overlaps with the feet. Due to this overlap, we need to take off 10 inches, or 25.4 centimeters. So the length we end up using for the average height is 4 feet 2 inches, or 1.27 meters. For width, we use 26 inches, or 66.04 centimeters, which includes any small space between the bodies. For depth, we use 9 inches, or 22.86 centimeters, for the body, but Arad mentions that half the crew worked at covering the bodies with a layer of sand, so we'll add 7 inches for that, or 17.78 centimeters. So the total depth is 16 inches, or 40.64 centimeters. Get a ruler or tape measure and see how these numbers compare to your own body. Multiplying the numbers we just came up with, we get 0 0.3408 cubic meters per body. Then we take that number and multiply it by the total amount buried to get 470,304 cubic meters. This is our estimation of the total burial space for 1.38 million people. Now let's see what Arad says about the pits that the bodies were buried in. On page 42 he writes regarding Treblinka. East of the gas chambers and close to them were huge ditches for burying the dead. The ditches were 50 meters long, 25 meters wide, and 10 meters deep. You're about to see a 3D model of the pit with the lengths Arad mentioned. As you can see, it is a huge pit. The length and width happen to be the same as a regulation Olympic swimming pool. Few swimming pools are that big. Not everyone has even seen one. Around four fit onto the area of a football field. But as you can see, the pits that we are talking about are much deeper than an Olympic swimming pool. If we multiply length times width times height, we get the cubic meters of this pit. We'll use 9 meters for height since Arad mentions that the top layer of the pit was dirt only. Each pit is 11,250 cubic meters. Let's create some space on this screen. We just figured out the cubic meters per pit. So how many pits would it take to hold all the bodies? 41.8. How many bodies could each pit hold? Each pit could hold around 33,000 bodies. One last passage before we look at a map. Arad writes on page 173, The last camp where cremation of the corpses was instituted was Treblinka. During Himmler's visit to the camp at the end of February, beginning of March 1943, he was surprised to find that in Treblinka, the corpses of over 700,000 Jews who had been killed there had not yet been cremated. Two things to notice here, the 700,000 number, and that Himmler's visit was at the end of February, beginning of March 1943. Here's the map. Notice it says Spring 1943. Here's the gas chamber, and here are the cremation grills. Here are the burial pits that we've been talking about. The map has no distance key, but Arad has mentioned that this water well was 20 meters from this barracks fence. This makes the pits seem a little smaller than 50 by 25 meters, but we'll say this is one full-sized pit. Here's two. We'll say this is a third, 
and these two make up four. So the question you got to ask yourself is, where are the 17 other pits? For this map to be accurate, it should look something like this. There should be 21 pits. Even if you halved this number to 20.3 centimeters or 8 inches, you would still need 10.6 pits for Treblinka. What about the possibility that the pits were deeper, or that they buried the bodies outside the camp perimeter, or that they buried the bodies in other parts of the camp? The entire evidence that Treblinka existed is based on eyewitness accounts. The prisoners who worked in the killing operations section slept here in the prisoners' barracks. They worked in this area nearly every day for up to a year before they escaped. They would have known the space well. These aren't possibilities for one, because the witnesses don't say they are. Plus, on a website called deathcamps.org, we see various Treblinka models that have burial spaces and layouts similar to Arad's map. Here's the 2004 LaPonder model. Here's the camp perimeter. Here's the killing operations area. Here's the gas chamber. Here are the pits. Here's the Peters model. Here's the camp perimeter. The killing operations area. The gas chamber. Here are the pits. It doesn't look like there's the equivalent to the area of 21 regulation Olympic swimming pools on these models either. So the problem isn't with Arad's map, since these models roughly correspond to it. The problem is that the people who made up the story didn't realize how much space 700,000 bodies would really take. They thought a few large pits would suffice. Arad writes on page 177, In Belzec, all 600,000 victims had been buried already when the cremation started. During a period of four to five months, they had to be unearthed and burned. So how much burial space is on the map for 600,000 people? We look on page 437, and we see the map is made by Dr. Y. Arad, who is the author of this book, and who for many years was the director of Israel's Holocaust Museum. Here are the pits. This is how much burial space is on the map for 600,000 people. And we see there's one, two, three, four, five. The long one at the top is described as anti-tank trench used as a burial pit. So we'll say that's one more to get six total burial pits. The problem is that there should be 18. We'll make a little space and look at the math. 0 0.3408 cubic meters per body times 600,000 bodies divided by 11,250 cubic meters per pit, that's the size of one pit, equals 18 pits. Someone might ask, well, since this map has no distance key and the previous passage about the pits was only about Treblinka, maybe these pits are simply a lot larger. It's true Arad's map has no distance key, but if we go to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum website and look up Belzec, we find that each side of the camp measured 886 feet. So we'll make that our distance key. If this length is 270 meters, then what is this length? We'll use the ruler tool in our computer program, which is called Photoshop. Watch the number next to the D here, which stands for distance. So if you look closely in the top right, we see the ruler tool coming into the screen. This is 14.82, and the length of this pit is 2.01. With these numbers, we can make this equation. 14.82 is to 270.05 meters as 2.01 is to x. Solving for x, we get 36.61 meters as the length of the pit. Measuring for width, we get 1.09. Plugging this number into our equation, we get the width of a pit as 19.86 meters. 
This is significantly less than the 50 by 25 meters we've been using. Doing the math from that, we find that we would need 31 pits of this size for 600,000 bodies. This is footage of the 2005 Rose Bowl game in Pasadena, California. If we go to the Rose Bowl website, we see that the stadium holds 90,000 plus, and the length of the stadium from rim to rim is 880 feet, which happens to be nearly the same as a side of the Belzic camp. Yet the Belzic map claims they need just a little portion of their space for bearing over six times the amount of spectators you see here. Time to play some football. And Dan, do you reckon there's a little cotton mouth out there? Arad estimates the total death toll for Sobibor at 250,000. Regarding burying the corpses, Arad writes on page 177, Only one-third of the 250,000 victims in this camp had been killed and buried there before the cremating began. Those who were gassed there afterward, in the period between October 1942 and October 1943, were taken directly from the gas chambers to the cremating sites. So one-third of 250,000 is how many were buried. That is 83,000. That's way less than at the other camps, but keep in mind that's not far from the amount of spectators that can fill the Pasadena Rose Bowl during the Rose Bowl game. So how much space on the Sobibor map is shown for burying 83,000 people? We look on page 35. There isn't a defined set of pits like on the other two maps. Number 54 is described as mass graves and outdoor crematoria. So they were buried somewhere in here. A lot of space is needed, but instead we're told it's somewhere in here. This is vague, so let's go to deathcamps.org again. We're looking at it in summer 2005. We can click on models to get a model of Sobibor and go to the Blatt model based on alleged survivor Thomas Toivy Blatt. It's quite similar to Arad's map when turned sideways. Here's the tube in Arad's map, and here's the tube in the Blatt model. Arad puts trees here, and Blatt puts a lawn, but in both we see a barbed wire fence here. Here's the extermination area. Here's the gas chamber. Here's the cremation grill. So just like on Arad's map, they buried the bodies maybe here and here. Deathcamps.org has a color close-up of the model in the area we want to see. The shot is from roughly where you see this camera here. Here it is. Here's the gas chamber. Here's the grill. And here's the fence. So just like on Arad's map, they buried the bodies maybe here and here. They buried roughly the equivalent to the stadium spectators of the Rose Bowl game here and here. This looks more like the area for burying 80 bodies, not 80,000. Here's another view. They buried 80,000 bodies here and here. Be seen. The uh, Longhorns, the visiting team, Michigan will be the home team, and they will wear. Here's another map of Sobibor also from deathcamps.org. This one was used at the Hagen West Germany Sobibor trial in the 1960s. Here's the tube. This map describes the burial area as amongst a coniferous forest. Coniferous trees are trees that bear cones and needle-like leaves. This is hard to read, but it says mass grave, and this says mass grave. They correspond roughly to the areas we were just pointing to on the Blatt model and on the map in Arad's book. This text is hard to read also, but it says Hen House. It's not much smaller than the burial pits on the map. This map was used as evidence in the trial where Carl Frenzel was sentenced to life in prison. Can you imagine getting sentenced to life in prison based on evidence where the space they give for burying 80,000 bodies are two pits not much bigger than the hen house? 
We're going to take a detour and look at Alexander Pechersky, who we are told was a highly competent Jewish Soviet army officer who headed the Sobibor uprising and escape. Remember Abraham Bomba's story involving a friend's wife coming in for a haircut at Treblinka? And how we found the story was strangely weak on the logistics side of things? Because they needed the woman's hair to be transported to Germany. We'll juxtapose emotional storytelling and logistics with Pechersky also. First, the storytelling. Alexander Pechersky wrote a book, which Arad uses as a source for this story on page 315. One of the sick was a young man from Holland who could hardly stand on his feet. His wife, who was in the women's barrack, found out where her husband was being taken. She threw herself at the Germans, screaming, Murderers! I know where you are taking my husband. Take me with him. I will not, you hear, I will not live without him. Murderers, scum. She took her husband's arm, supporting him, and marched off with the others to her death. Now let's look at Pechersky's ability to put forth some logistical facts via a drawing of the camp. If Pechersky had really been there observing everything, he would not have drawn a map like this. Considering that, look at the sketch while I read from page 310 in Arad. From the talks with Feldhandler and from his own observations, Pechersky learned about everything he needed for planning a mass escape. He gathered information about the camp and its occupants, about the security arrangements, the fences, and the minefields, and about the routine of life in the camp. Wow. The stories always come through with quite a wallop, but the logistics never seem to come through at all. Arad writes about Pechersky in a flattering way, but that's nothing compared to what Hollywood can do. Here we are in the Internet Movie Database, and we'll scroll down and see that Alexander Pechersky is played by Rutger Hauer. By the way, there's Thomas Toivy Blatt of the Blatt model. We'll click on the link to the trailer. Here's the map, here's Pachersky, here's Hollywood. Action adventure hero Rutger Hauer stars in an incredible true tale of courage and triumph. Those of you who survive, bear witness. Let the world know what has happened here. Escape from Sobibor. You have arrived at Sobibor. This is a labor camp. If you do your jobs, you will have nothing to fear. During the Nazi rule, the most secret and brutal camp of all was Sobibor. This is a death camp. Every day a train comes. All the people, everyone who goes to the showers is dead. Men, women, children, everyone. We survive for a reason. We win. Someday we will have it. It is here that one man devised the most daring escape of World War II. Alexander Pachersky loses all credibility because he describes a gas chamber floor that opens up so that all the people can fall into carts on the railroad tracks below. In Carlo Matono's book, Belzec, we read Pachersky's description of the Sobibor gas chamber floor. At first sight, one has the impression of entering a bathhouse like any other, faucets for hot and cold water, wash basins. As soon as all have entered, the doors are closed with a heavy thump. A heavy black substance comes down in swirls from the openings in the ceiling. One hears frantic screams, but not for very long, because they change to gasping, suffocating breaths and to convulsions. Mothers are said to have been covering their children with their bodies. The bathkeeper observes the whole procedure through a window in the ceiling. Within a quarter of an hour, everything is over. The floor opens and the corpses fall into carts waiting below in the basement of the bathhouse. As soon as they are full, they move away quickly. It is all done according to the latest German technology. Outside, the corpses are discharged in a certain order and doused with gasoline, which is then lit. Right there, they burn. Here's the source. It's a passage from Pachersky's book that Yitzhak Arad conveniently leaves out of his chapter on Pachersky. 
No historian today believes in the collapsing floor, but supposed eyewitnesses were still saying this as late as 1961, when one of them wound up on the witness stand in the Eichmann trial. Yakov Biskowitz testified for half an hour, and then the judge asked him for some clarification on the collapsing gas chamber floor, which Biskowitz had casually mentioned. The judge likely knows that's not part of the accepted story and tries to make a save by hoping Biskowitz will say the floor is something he didn't personally see, he just heard about. The judge asks, You described the inside of the gas chamber. For example, you told us how the floor opened up and the bodies fell below into the railway wagons. Into the hollow below. Did you see this with your own eyes? Or are you talking of things that you heard from others? I will describe a shocking scene here. But first of all, did you, in general, have an opportunity of seeing these things from the inside? Not everybody had the opportunity, but I, by chance, did. Then Biskowitz tells a very weak story, which I'll spare you, and the judge then asks a point-blank question. Please understand me, you are somewhat familiar with these matters. Did you see the floor when it had opened up? I did not see that. I merely saw that underneath the gas chamber, there was a hollow which already contained bodies. Thank you, Mr. Biskowitz. You have concluded your testimony. I know you have not told us everything, but there was no alternative. There was another shocking case which I witnessed, and I should like to describe just this one further incident. I am very sorry. I have already explained it to you. It is not only those who appear here who want to relate their story, and it is simply not possible. Thank you very much and shalom. Biskowitz got shooed off the witness stand, but he still made it into Yitzhak Arad's book. Here's Arad using Biskowitz's Eichmann trial testimony. Like Hilberg, Arad gleans seemingly credible passages from discredited accounts. Biskowitz got over-diabolical with his story, but he still made the New York Times the next day, not as a discredited witness, but as a star witness. In an article titled, Mutiny of the Jews at Camp Related, we see that the New York Times, having had nearly 20 years to get the Sobibor story straight, tells their readers that, after the Jews had been gassed, the floor of the chambers opened and the bodies were dropped into trolleys for the run to the crematory pits. The New York Times can't get the story right because the witnesses can't get the story straight because they're lying. That's likely why there was no attempt by Israel's Holocaust Museum to preserve the Eichmann trial film footage. A key point is that the Eichmann trial wasn't just about Eichmann. It covered the whole alleged Holocaust, and 500 hours of footage was filmed. In an article in The Nation, we read what Israel's Holocaust Museum did with the footage. Not only were the tapes left to deteriorate in an uncatalogued heap, with the rights to them sold piecemeal, a frequent fate of films and television footage, but the material was eventually made inaccessible. When the young Israeli filmmaker Eyal Sivan learned of the tapes in 1991 and asked to see them, he was informed that this footage didn't exist. This wasn't a complete lie. When Sivan and writer Roni Brauman at last got their hands on the tapes, they estimated that a third of the footage had decayed so badly that it could no longer be viewed. And therein lies the strength of Steven Spielberg's Shoah project, not in preserving film, but because after 50 years, people were finally getting the story straight, with the help of Spielberg minimizing the facts and focusing on emotional content. The survivors of the Shoah have given us all a powerful message for the future. Now it's up to you to help deliver that message. Notice the sad music in the background. I asked this couple, when are we going to be reunited with our parents? And she pointed to the 
one of the chimneys of the crematoria, which I didn't even see until then. And it was then that I noticed these four brick chimneys bellowing fire and soot. And she said, do you see this chimney? I said, yes. She says, there go your parents. And when you be re when you go through the chimneys, you'll be reunited. Maybe they're not getting the story straight after 50 years because the chimney is attached to a crematory oven and a crematory oven wouldn't produce a flame that would come out the top of the chimney. She says four brick chimneys bellowing fire and soap, although she meant smoke. Until then, and it was then that I noticed these four brick chimneys bellowing fire and soot. And she said, do you see this chimney? I said, yes. She says, there go your parents. And when you be re when you go through the chimneys, you'll be reunited. This young black man might be thinking that the slavery that happened to his ancestors is nothing compared to the Holocaust. Except what happened to his ancestors really happened. Seeing the faces and hearing the voices of survivors helps students make the connection between history and the moral choices they confront in their own lives. The third act is turning the survivors into educators. The challenge then presented itself to transform these deeply personal testimonies into practical tools of education. She might be an American Indian learning about the Holocaust, but why is it that the theme of we can't let history repeat itself never presented when learning about the American Indians? So that a native population somewhere else is not destroyed. The American Indians were an indigenous people who got kicked off their land and decimated. And in this case, history is repeating itself because indigenous people, like the Palestinians, are getting kicked off their land by the Israelis. Practical tools of education. I feel it's my obligation to inform and educate those kids and tell them that actually the Holocaust did happen. And maybe by education, we can prevent the not Holocaust. We are told that Pachersky's original plan for escape was to dig a narrow underground tunnel out of the camp. We see on page 311, according to the plan, its height and width would have to be 75 by 75 centimeters, and it would need to be 80 centimeters beneath the Earth's surface so that it would not touch the mine holes. It could not go any deeper because there was a danger that it might strike water. He goes on to write, the digging progressed smoothly for a few days, but on October 8th and 9th, heavy rains fell on the camp and water penetrated the tunnel and flooded it completely. When Sibiltsky entered the tunnel on the night of October 9th, he found it utterly wrecked. The tunnel escape plan had to be abandoned. This brings up an interesting question. Why is it that rain is never mentioned as a problem with the outdoor cremation process? We've seen models, maps, and testimony. There isn't even a piece of elevated corrugated metal high above the fires to protect them from the rain, as seen here with the Laponder model of Treblinka, or here with the Blatt model of Sobibor. The fire always sits out in the open, where rain would put it out. In reading Arad and Hilberg, I never found a passage mentioning rain as a problem. They mention problems, but not with rain. For instance, on page 100, Arad writes, the frequent engine breakdowns caused disturbances and delays in the entire extermination process. An engine not starting is a problem few civilians even have with their car or truck. Can you believe that that, of all things, would be the problem they mention? Maybe the cremations didn't happen during the rainy season. Except then we look in a rat on page 170 and read, The cremation of the corpses in the camps of Sobibor and Belzec began in the autumn of 1942, and in Treblinka in March 1943. Here's Claude Landsman on the right in his movie Shoah. It's Disc 1, Chapter 29. Landsman is visiting Treblinka sometime in the 70s or early 80s and interviewing people there. Dużo się robiło, wie pani, dużo. Tak, tak sobie 
Je dis que maintenant, quand on y pense, on ne comprend pas comment un homme puisse faire ça à un autre être humain. When the Treblinka, Belzic, and Sobibor story was made up, it didn't dawn on the storytellers that Rain would create a logistical problem with the story. There's some irony here in that Landsman is at Treblinka, hearing about how Treblinka happened, but he's also documenting how the outdoor cremations couldn't have happened because he's documenting the rain. We see logistical problems with the story, thanks to Landsman's footage. In this next part, watch the background right here. Żydzi chcieli wody, nie? No i chodzi Ukrainiec. No i, i nie, nie, nie kazał podać, nie da. That was Treblinka. Here we have Landsman documenting the weather at Sobibor, Disc 2, Chapter 4. But Belzik is only around 70 miles south, so he's sort of documenting the weather there too. Arad writes on page 177, In Belzik, all 600,000 victims had been buried already when the cremation started. During a period of four to five months, they had to be unearthed and burned. This was the sole reason for the continued existence of the camp, along with its entire personnel, until the spring of 1943. So we're supposed to believe that the Germans would choose as the best cremation method for the equivalent of the spectators of six and a half Rose Bowl stadiums, an outdoor cremation fire in weather like this. In the following passage, see if you can spot the inherent contradiction. It's in the trial testimony of SS officer Heinrich Gley, seen in Yitzhak Arad's book on page 172. As I remember, the gassing stopped at the end of 1942 when snow was already falling. Then the unearthing and cremation of the corpses began. It lasted from November 1942 until March 1943. The cremation was conducted day and night without interruption. We see when snow was already falling and day and night without interruption. Hmm. And I guess the surface of the ground freezing was no problem either, you know, for digging out the bodies, even though Landsman documented that too for us. En hiver, il fait très froid ici. U nas? To zależy, to wie pani nawet do 25 do 30 mróz. Parfois ja mam moins 25, moins 30. So for Fahrenheit that's between 5 degrees and minus 4. To cremate a body you need heat, and the problem with an outdoor fire is you lose most of your heat to the outside air, particularly if there's wind. Strange that the Germans, known for being efficient, are using such an inefficient method. A simple five-foot-high brick wall on one side of the cremation grill would reflect much-needed heat back toward the bodies, and also protect the fire from the wind. But we're supposed to believe that the Germans didn't even do that. The fire sits out in the open. It's because the storytellers were not familiar with building outdoor fires, Thus, in the Peters model and Leponder model of Treblinka seen here, and in the descriptions in Hilberg and Arad, we find that there was no wall. Consider this when looking at the following text in Arad on page 176. Moreover, the fire and billowing smoke from the roaster could be seen for miles around. They were evident even at Treblinka Penal Camp 1, located three kilometers away. This is confusing, but there was another camp called Treblinka 1, which was not a death camp, but a labor camp, located a little less than two miles away. We'll start again. Moreover, the fire and billowing smoke from the roaster could be seen for miles around. They were evident even at Treblinka Penal Camp 1, located three kilometers away. A prisoner at Treblinka 1 described what he saw. The spring winds brought with them the smell of burning bodies from the nearby extermination camp. We breathed in the stench of smoldering corpses. We heard the clatter of the excavators for days and nights on end. At night we gazed at skies red from the flames. Sometimes you could also see tongues of flames rising into the night. So we have the spring winds that blow smoke nearly two miles away, and yet the fires don't even have a wall on one side to reflect the heat and protect from the wind. It gets worse, though. The storytellers didn't know how to build an outdoor fire. 
Listen to this on page 173 in Arad from a document used in Joseph Oberhauser's trial. The corpses were laid in layers, alternated with a layer of wood. So they put down a layer of bodies, then a layer of wood, then a layer of bodies, then a layer of wood. Anyone who's ever built an outdoor fire knows that wouldn't work. This is an urban demographic talking about something they don't know about. Or on page 174, Arad writes, The cremating structure consisted of a roaster made from five or six railroad rails laid on top of three rows of concrete pillars, each 70 centimeters high. That is two feet three and a half inches, which isn't much higher than a campfire. Here's another description on page 175. There, another special team, called the Burning Group, Feuer Cologne, removed the corpses from the stretchers and arranged them in layers on the roaster to a height of two meters. Two meters is six and a half feet, so with room under the rails not much higher than a campfire, they're saying you could then stack the bodies six and a half feet high. The bodies on top wouldn't even get warm, let alone be cremated. Arad never mentions adding more wood to the fire. Nor does he mention anyone rotating the bodies on the bottom layer with the upper layers. Rather, it's described like this on page 176. The body burning went on day and night. The corpses were transferred and arranged on the roasters during the day. At nightfall they were lit, and they burned throughout the night. When the fire went out, there was only skeletons or scattered bones on the roasters, and piles of ash underneath. Yankel Wiernik wasn't the only eyewitness to say that bodies burn on their own. Here is Yekiel Reichman. We see a lack of fire knowledge, all of which he attributes to an SS burning expert. The SS expert on body burning ordered us to put women, particularly fat women, on the first layer on the grill, face down. The second layer could consist of whatever was brought, men, women, or children, and so on layer on top of layer. Then the expert ordered us to lay dry branches under the grill and to light them. Within a few minutes the fire would take, so it was difficult to approach the crematorium from as far as 50 meters away, which is 54 yards, around half a football field. Yes, just lay some dry branches under the grill. The logistical part of Reichman's account is so bad that we know he's not telling the truth. Bodies don't burn like wood logs on outdoor fires, yet he's quoted and used as a source frequently in Arad's book. Going from page 175 to page 216, we see another Yekiel Reichman quote, which I won't read, where he gets a little carried away with the emotional content, beseechingly asking, Where is God when they are murdering the newborn children? We have already mentioned that the original plan for escape out of Sobibor was an underground tunnel. Listen to the tunnel description looking for how deep it was underground. According to the plan, the tunnel's height and width would have to be 75 by 75 centimeters, and it would need to be 80 centimeters beneath the Earth's surface so that it would not touch mine holes. It could not go any deeper because there was a danger that it might strike water. What Yitzhak Arad means is this. We'll use a beachside cliff to illustrate. They have to start the tunnel 80 centimeters beneath the Earth's surface because there could be landmines here. The tunnel is 75 centimeters by 75 centimeters. It can't go any deeper because there was a danger that it might strike water. So past what distance is there the danger of striking water? 80 centimeters plus 75 centimeters, which is 1.55 meters. That is 5 feet 1 inch. If you go past that, there's danger of striking water. And who better to know that than the inmates? After all, they're the ones who put the bodies in the burial pits. Now let's see how deep the burial pits were. Remember this 1.55 number. Yitzhak Arad writes on page 33, the burial pits were five to seven meters deep. Seven meters is 23 feet. So here you can only dig five feet one inch, and here you can dig 23 feet. Well, maybe the land at Sobibor had different elevations so that one could dig deeper in certain areas. But thanks to Claude Landsman's movie Shoah, DVD Disc 1, Chapter 42, we can find out. Here's Landsman sitting at the Sobibor train station. 
That's the Sobibor train station sign right there. Le bâtiment de la gare, les rails, les quais, c'est exactement les mêmes que en 1942. Rien n'a changé depuis 1942. W tym miejscu, gdzie się znajdujemy, przebiegała wschodnia granica obozu w kierunku tamtych drzew widocznych. Il y avait une palisade qui allait juste vers ces arbres qu'on voit là. So that's all flat land. A tu w kierunku zachodnim na te drzewa liściaste przebiegała. And that's all flat land. Granica południowa obozu. Et puis il y avait une autre palisade qui allait vers les arbres qu'on voit là-bas. And that's all flat land. Yet the tunnel digging couldn't go past five feet one inch, but the burial pits are described as 23 feet deep. Hmm. Now let's walk a few paces out of top secret death camp and back to public train station. Let's look at the U.S. Holocaust Museum website on the Sobibor entry. We see they've described the area with the word swampy. That's odd that the Germans would pick a swampy area for digging large pits to bury thousands of bodies. Basically, the storytellers picked the spot, not the Germans. The storytellers only remembered the possibility of striking water while digging a hole when it came to their drama. Claude Landsman and a film crew paid a surprise visit to the workplace of Joseph Oberhauser sometime in the 1970s. Joseph Oberhauser was allegedly an official at the Belzec camp. We see in a rad on page 400 that 20 years after the war, the West German government began a number of trials against alleged members of the Reinhard camps. Why they waited 20 years, I don't know. Life sentences were being given. One allegedly committed suicide. A couple years before in the Soviet Union, 13 people were sentenced to death. Joseph Oberhauser got four and a half years. He'd already spent years of his post-war life in prison due to a Soviet military tribunal conviction. But four and a half years is a strangely lenient sentence if one believes he was a top administrator in a death camp that killed over half a million people. I think I know why he got such a light sentence. Next is Landsman's Shoah DVD Disc 2, Chapter 2. Sobibor and Treblinka both allegedly had mass escapes, so there were a number of Jewish inmate eyewitnesses. Belzec, in contrast, only had one escapee who survived into the post-war period. A couple others allegedly escaped but did not survive past 1946. The one surviving Belzec inmate was Rudolf Rieder, the one survivor for 600,000 people. But the way he escaped is kind of hard to believe. Arad quotes Rudolf Rieder's book on page 264 and 265. One morning I was told by the bully Ehrman that there was need for tin in the camp. I went with a truck accompanied by four SS men and a guard to Lvov. After a whole day of loading the tin sheets, I remained in the car under the guard of one of the bullies while all the others went for entertainment. For hours I sat without moving then I saw that my guard had fallen asleep and was snoring. 
Without thinking instinctively, I slid down the car. The bully continued sleeping. I stood on the sidewalk, appearing as if I were arranging the tin sheets, but slowly moving toward Legionow Street, where the traffic was quite heavy. I pulled my hat over my eyes. The streets were dark and nobody saw me. I remembered where a Polish woman, my landlady, lived. I went there and she hid me. Here are some problems I have with Rudolf Reeder's story. Number one, I can't really picture prisoners in a top secret death camp going on basic errands into the middle of a city. Number two, the SS were the elite forces of the German army. Why would four of them go do an errand, as opposed to just regular members of the German army? Could Reader have been making it more dramatic by having his story include four SS men? Number three, there's six people, four SS men, a guard, and Reader. With five able-bodied men, was it really necessary to take one inmate and jeopardize the secrecy of the camp? especially considering that Rudolf Reeder was 61 years old. We look at the University of California Library Catalog and see Born, 1881. Considering that they went into town to load up a truck with metal plates, which could be heavy, and with all the people in the camp to choose from, why bring a 61-year-old man as that sixth person? Also, notice this book here and in Arad's bibliography. Such an important account, yet no English translation until 1999. By the way, while we're here, if you're wondering what a bibliography on the Reinhard camps looks like, here's Samuel Rosman, the guy that testified at Nuremberg that they used women's hair for mattresses for German women. Down here is Jekiel Reichmann, the guy who put fat women face down on the fire because they burned the best. Here is Eli Rosenberg, a guy who testified at the Eichmann trial that they packed 400 people into each bedroom-sized room at the Treblinka gas chamber and mentioned repeatedly that the exhaust they used was from a diesel engine. And here's Adelbert Rueckerl, a Holocaust writer who heavily relies on Joseph Oberhauser's confession. Before we segue into looking at a slice of Yitzhak Arad's bibliography, we were looking at problems with Rudolf Reeder's Belzec escape story. Let's get back to that. Number four, the guard fell asleep and started snoring? With a camp run like this, why did no one else escape? Number five, he pulled his hat over his eyes so no one would see his face, but does that mean he was wearing street clothes? Shouldn't he have been more worried about some sort of a uniform he was wearing rather than people recognizing his face? Landsman's group continues to pose as a film crew doing a piece on beer sales. If Rudolf Reeder was the only inmate eyewitness to survive out of 600,000 people, and he got out by going on an errand into town, that means the security around the camp perimeter must have been tight. Let's look at Arad's map to see the fortifications. There are watchtowers on the corners of the camp, but besides that there's just this, a barbed wire fence. I thought that barbed wire was used to keep farm animals in an enclosure. Can't humans just grab it where there's no barb? and pull it apart so that someone else can crawl through. But this wasn't just any barbed wire fence. It had tree branches woven into it. Here's the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum website in summer 2005. We'll come up here and highlight something. 
Fine bows woven into the barbed wire fence and trees planted around the perimeter served as camouflage. Ah, now that's some good design for a security fence in a death camp. But wouldn't the branches hang up on the barbs and make the barbs ineffective? And also, here's the story I have. During Christmas, I noticed that my Christmas tree gets dry and brittle in a matter of weeks, and the needles start falling off onto the floor. Funny how that same thing wouldn't happen with branches in this fence, what with the roaring cremation fires blowing smoke and heat all over the place. And strange that if they can go into town on an errand for something as obscure as tin sheets to the city of Lvov, as Rudolf Reeder said, that they couldn't also go and get some normal fencing material there also. <laughs> What was Joseph Oberhauser's job at Belzec? We read in a rad on page 24. SS Oberscharfuhrer Joseph Oberhauser, a former euthanasia man, was placed in charge of building the camp. If Oberhauser built the Belzig death camp, that means he built and maybe even designed the fence. Which begs the question, does this look like a man that would choose barbed wire with tree branches propped into it for a security fence in a top secret death camp? It's absurd. Oberhauser got caught in the middle of a big fraud. His facial expressions convey that, while being harassed at his job by landsmen. My guess is Joseph Oberhauser saw the specter of getting sentenced to life in prison, and he made a deal that involved a confession during the pretrial interrogations. Maybe he figured that the story was already so obviously fraudulent that it wouldn't matter if he threw the prosecutor a few bones in order to not get a life sentence. Historians have been relying on Oberhauser's confession to support the validity of the Belzec story ever since. This is Ral Hilberg. And here's Yitzhak Arad. Und die uh, Fahrt dorthin, die ist immer sehr anschaulich von seinem früheren Fahrer Oberhauser geschildert worden. Und die äh, Fahrt dorthin, die ist immer sehr anschaulich von seinem früheren Fahrer Oberhauser geschildert worden. Dobosny kam also an, es war ein heißer Eu Sometimes at the beach, you see an eroding cliff that reveals sediment layers. If large pits had been dug at Sobibor, Belzec, or Treblinka, perhaps sediment layers might have been seen on the walls there too. The prominent sediment layer we see here can probably be found throughout the region, and would show up if we were to take a core sample some distance away. The process of digging a large pit and filling it back in, however, destroys the sediment layers. An experiment one could do at the camps would be to take core samples from a nearby field just outside the camp, and compare it to core samples taken inside the camp. By comparing the sediment layers, one could determine if large pits were ever dug. To illustrate this, here is a photo of Treblinka in the 1960s. This is roughly the perimeter of the camp, and this is roughly the alleged killing and burial area of the camp where 700,000 were at one time purportedly buried. If 10 meter core samples, which is 33 feet, were taken in the outlying fields that were not part of the Treblinka camp, such as the areas shown with blue circles here, and those samples had geologic sediment patterns, then what if all the samples inside the burial part had the same patterns? It would show the whole thing's a big lie. It seems so self-evident to do this experiment, yet no one ever has. 
Let's turn away from comparing core samples with the outlying fields and focus on what we should find in just the core samples inside the camp. The obvious one is bone fragments, but also consider ash and charred remnants from 225 million pounds of wood burned and buried inside the yellow area. 750,000 people multiplied by the low estimate of 300 pounds of wood per person gives us 225 million pounds of wood. Then there's this passage on page 125 in Yitzhak Arad's book. Sand or chlorine was scattered between the layers of bodies. So what if chlorine traces didn't come up in lab analysis of the core samples? And what about teeth? German engineer Arnulf Neumeyer wrote an article on Treblinka in 1990. Here's what he said about teeth. And finally, we must note that the teeth of the supposed victims could not have been destroyed by the primitive methods attested to. Even if each of the alleged victims had only 20 of the usual 32 teeth left at the time he or she died, there would have been at least 17.5 million teeth to be disposed of at Treblinka. This means that we should still be able to find some five teeth per cubic foot of the 3.53 million cubic feet of material excavated at the alleged site of the crime. He's basing the numbers on 875,000 total deaths, which is the figure a 1980s Jerusalem court gave for Treblinka. The quote is from a book called Dissecting the Holocaust, page 471. So we have two types of core sample research, one to determine if the earth was ever disturbed, and the other to basically find out what's underground. You have a third option too, shovels, which is actually the best way of all. So there's never been a study of this kind with sediment layers. There's only been one study of this kind, that was at Belzec. There's never been one for Treblinka or Sobibor. And just straight up digging? No one has done that in 60 years. Since 1946 when the Soviets and Soviet installed governments briefly did it. The lack of searching for physical evidence is shocking. Consider that scientists will do core sample studies on all sorts of things. Here's a Seattle, Washington newspaper article about a scientist who takes an eight foot long core sample off the ocean floor. Here's a June 13, 2005 San Francisco Chronicle article on a geologist who took core samples that showed when past tsunamis had hit. So why would there be so few studies at the three camps? To answer that, let's look at another camp, Auschwitz, and what has happened to people who have looked for physical evidence there. Fred Leuchter was the first person to take samples from the walls at Auschwitz to test for cyanide residue. Not used to being filmed, here he is talking to the cameraman who documented it. I guess you're, I guess you're getting me. Yep. Sample from the roof. I am now bagging. Okay. Now I will find another sample of brick from the wall we were not able to get at from the surface, which is over here. His interpretation of the test results made him believe gassings had never happened at Auschwitz. The life change he went through after publishing his results are found in a talk he gave called The Botched Execution of Fred Leuchter, where he writes, My life has been turned upside down, and my family and I have been repeatedly threatened. There is no slippery slope for Mr. Fred Leuchter. The man is an anti-Semite. There are hate mongers in this country, and he's one of them. He handed over his entire life and reputation to the cause of spreading hatred. He didn't stop. He kept on going. He could have gotten out any time. You know, what kind of man is he? And why is he doing this? And what kind of reflection is this upon our community?
to me, looks like he's almost under a spell. And I think he is. He's under his own spell. So you can see why we know more about the 1700 tsunami than what's underground at Treblinka. Those clips are from the movie Mr. Death. The filmmaker had to rework the documentary after a preliminary screening at Harvard University had some students believing Leuchter's theory. Leuchter was criticized for having no technical academic credentials and for the way the lab analyzed the samples. But then German citizen Germar Rudolph, who was working on his PhD in chemistry at the time at the Max Planck Institute, tested and analyzed the walls with very sound methodology. He came to the same conclusions as Leuchter. Then he was persecuted also. After publishing his findings, he had to flee Germany due to the Holocaust denial laws there. Coming to the United States, he ran a revisionist website and publishing company called VHO and applied for political asylum based on free speech. That was not given to him. The U.S. government arrested him and sent him back to Germany where he is now in jail. In short, there's been very little searching for physical evidence at Treblinka, Belzec, and Sobibor. And from looking at Leuchter and Rudolf, we can see why. Scientists don't want the harassment that comes with it. Germar is in jail at the time of making this video, but his website is still up. As it turns out, we need a book available from there called Belzec by Carlo Matono, a book that has way more information on the excavations than Arad or Hilberg. We scroll down through the books, books that could get you arrested in much of Western Europe, and download the free PDF version. In chapter four, we find out about the one core sample study that was ever done, the one at Belzec. The archaeologist who did the study was handpicked and commissioned by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and a Polish Holocaust Remembrance Group. It's unlikely they'd pick someone who had any possibility of finding things that didn't support the story, but strangely enough, he did anyway. The archaeologist was Andrzej Kola. He took manual core samples, 2,227 of them, one every five meters, which is one every 16 feet. He claimed to find mass graves in about one in 10 of the samples. And in his report, he had a map showing where he believed the mass graves to be. Robin O'Neill, who was involved with Cola's team, then simplified it by drawing this map. But look at the irregular shapes of the graves, like this one, or this one, or this one. Notice how they are oriented in all sorts of different directions and spread out all over the camp. The German military would never have done it that way. You've heard of the phrase military formation. That means orderly formation, which is how things work in any military. This is neither orderly nor would it have been sanitary. Plus, let's look at Yitzhak Arad's map for a moment. What is number three in the top left highlighted in red? If we look on the map key, we find that it is the Ukrainian living quarters. Number four right here says, Barber, clinic, dentist for the SS and Ukrainians. Number five is the Ukrainian kitchen. And remember that on Arad's map, the graves are in an orderly arrangement on the right side. Contrast that to this. Now let's superimpose the graves Kola found onto Arad's map. Mass graves surround the German SS medical clinic and dental office and are right next to the Ukrainian kitchen. The Germans wouldn't have done it this way. By the way, notice the direction north on the two maps I just compared to show I had the maps in the right direction. Some final points on the Kola study. First, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum didn't seek out Kola to find out if there were graves. They assumed the evidence was there, but wanted to know where because they had plans to build a memorial and they didn't want the construction to disturb the graves. Carlo Matono sums up the problems with the study on page 77 of his book. The only way to dispel any uncertainty would obviously have been to unearth the corpses buried in the graves. Why did the Polish authorities not do this? 
If the main objective of the archaeological research was the identification of the mass graves, why were the corpses buried in these graves not exhumed? When the Germans discovered the graves of the victims of the Soviet NKVD at Katyn and Venezia, they did not simply drill holes in the ground with a manual drill. They opened the graves, exhumed the corpses, did autopsies, and tried to identify them. The next two paragraphs show the incredible detail in which the Germans documented the Soviet mass killings they discovered. That's the only time this caliber of documentation happened. Feel free to pause the video and read the paragraphs. The Soviets could never produce any kind of documentation like this. One thing the Soviets did was make movies of the camps, but the movies were so over the top that they're not believable. These clips are from a video about the 1961 Adolf Eichmann trial seen here at the Internet Movie Database. The video shows how at one point in the courtroom, they set up a movie projector right next to Eichmann to confront him with a film of Auschwitz taken by the Soviet Union. But the film shows how the Soviets went over the top in their lies. With tattoos that look like they're drawn on rice paper rather than on human skin, but also because here in the film strip is a bucket of human heads with people in some kind of pillory thing over here, as if the Germans would just leave this when they evacuated. Here's Eichmann watching the film, knowing it's a fraud. Back to comments on the Kola study. Number two, Andres H. Kola's study was the only searching for physical evidence at the three camps in 50 years. Keep in mind that there are cases where detectives have spent more time looking for physical evidence for a single murder. Number three, Kola hit water at around five meters. Matona quotes Kola on page 72. The majority of graves situated here reached the depth of four to five meters. One can suppose that those depths were regarded as the optimum ones. Underground waters appeared at bigger depths. This means the pits were not as deep as what you're seeing here. With the depth given by Kola, we'd need twice as many. It would take 36 pits. I drew this to scale. It looks like it takes around 80% of the whole camp. Feel free to pause the video and look at the math if interested. Number four, Kola found bodies, which doesn't support the part of the story that they cremated all the bodies. Which brings up the last point, number five, why were the bodies there? Matono points out that only a handful of the 2,227 core samples hit bodies. Extrapolating from that, Matona writes on page 79, One may conclude that the most probable interpretation is that the graves contained at most several hundred corpses. There was a typhus epidemic in Poland. Matono believes that most of those bodies were typhus victims. On page 108, Matona describes the situation of the Jews sent to Belzec. They were in a transit camp from which they would be moved to other labor camps in the east, but first they had to take a shower and be disinfested. This is hard to imagine nowadays. The disease typhus is extremely rare, and most young people have never even seen lice, the tiny insects that carried the disease. For many, the only glimpse that this might have been how things worked in a camp would be a TV or movie portrayal of a penal camp. Here's an example from the 70s television show, Charlie's Angels. Everything, Sabrina. And I've already made arrangements for you three to go to prison. Prison? You've got to be kidding, Charlie. It's no joke, Angels. You can say that again. Bosley, just how are we supposed to get into the prison? Oh, don't worry, Jill. In Pine Parish. That's easy. <sighs> Terrific. <laughs>
we see a penal camp, a shower, and delousing spray, similar to the elements that Carlo Matono is talking about. But suppose you couldn't speak the same language as the guards, so you didn't know what the spray was, and there was a rumor that the spray would kill you, which brings to mind Abraham Bamba. He might not have been completely lying. He might have been cutting hair for delousing sessions, all along thinking he was a cog in the wheel of a death factory. They told us to leave the gas chamber for a few minutes, about five minutes, where they put in the gas and they choked him to death. Where did you wait? Outside the gas chamber. And in two minutes, not even two minutes, in one minute everything was clear. And it was clean to take in the other party of the other woman to go through the same thing what the first one they went through. Perhaps the reason everything was clear and clean in one minute was because everyone walked out on their own two feet after being deloused. Neither Raoul Hilberg or Yitzhak Arad mention anything about when the Soviets took over the Treblinka area. Instead, we get this from revisionist researchers Carlo Matono and Jurgen Graf in their book Treblinka. They write on page 177, in the middle of August 1944, the 65th Soviet Army conquered the region around Treblinka. Just as Jarowski went to work immediately, supported by other officers, and carried out investigations between August 15th and 23rd. Jarowski also questioned former alleged inmates such as Samuel Rosman. Jarowski and his group found three mass graves containing 305 people. But first of all, that is nowhere near the 750,000 people allegedly killed. And secondly, that doesn't fit with the part of the story that they cremated all the bodies. Matono and Graf quote from Jarowski's official report. The Camp Treblinka II was an enormous death combine in which the SS men ruthlessly and zealously exterminated millions of people. Before we highlight the next passage, consider that Treblinka was 50 miles from Warsaw, and Jews put on the trains were allowed to take bags with them, but here in Jarowski's report we read, While traveling they were dying of hunger, there was no water, they drank urine. It's common knowledge that drinking urine will only dehydrate a person more, but strangely, drinking urine may have been part of the lore of the Treblinka story, Segwaying into this for a moment, we go to the Voices of the Holocaust Project at the Illinois Institute of Technology. We find that Professor Boder was a professor at IIT when he traveled to Europe in 1946 in order to accurately record the experiences of Holocaust victims during the World War II. Dr. Boder was able to record 109 interviews totaling 120 hours onto a wire recorder developed by the IIT professor Dr. Marvin Cameras, who by the way later invented the videotape recorder. Portable voice recording was a new technology at the time, but Boder might have been surprised at what he found. We'll look at his interview transcript with Benjamin Piscores, talking about his trip to Treblinka. And also during the ride, I was terribly thirsty, so there was there an acquaintance, a comrade of mine whom I begged from the terrible thirst that he should for me even knew, I don't know how to say it, because urine. Yes. He made urine into my mouth. How? Directly? In the wagon, directly. Professor Boder then asks, what does it mean he made directly into? He made into my directly. He urinated, urinated. From his, from his yes, from his body? Yes, into your mouth? straight into the mouth because of the terrible thirst. This wasn't the first case because all the people drank this way. Hmm. Ral Hilberg and Yitzhak Arad conveniently leave things like this out of their books, for they are trying to mold a believable narrative out of the legend. We continue looking at the first Soviet report on Treblinka. 
Scrolling down, we find that after the newly arrived had deposited their valuables with the cashier and stripped naked, they were allowed to go on and were led along the sand-strewn flower-bordered avenue into the bath, where they were given soap, a towel, and underclothing. After depositing of the valuables already on the way to the bath, the polite tone gave way to roughness. Those who were walking were urged on by rods and beaten with canes. Let me see if I get this right. On the way to the bath, they're beaten with canes and urged on by rods. So that pretty much ends the ruse, this elaborate masquerade that they are going to bathe. But we're supposed to believe that once they arrive at the bath, the masquerade begins anew and they're given soap, a towel, and underclothing. That doesn't make sense. Scrolling down to the bottom, we find the method of killing. Behind the bath stood a machine. It pumped the air out of the room. The people suffocated within six to ten minutes. Ask anybody who studied physics and they will tell you that if you pumped the air out of a room, the room would implode. And how could they have interviewed all these escaped inmate eyewitnesses, including Samuel Rosman, who later testified at Nuremberg, and got the method of execution so wrong? What happened is that somebody later tipped everyone off that the method of execution in their story didn't fit with the laws of physics, and they then changed it to something more believable. Because this first Soviet report supports the Treblinka story being a hoax, Arad and Hilbert conveniently leave it out of their books. Auschwitz and Treblinka have some similarities. Both allegedly had gas chambers, both were in Poland, and both were run by the SS. When Soviet forces arrived at Treblinka, they found what looked like an abandoned farm. Here's Matono and Graf's book, quoting the first Soviet report. What remains are the walls of the burned residential building and of the cattle stall of the colonist Strebel, who was settled on the territory of the camp. When the Soviets first arrived at Auschwitz, however, they found something quite different. Ral Hilberg writes on page 983 of his book, When the Soviets moved in, 29 of 35 storerooms had been burned down. In six of the remaining ones, the liberators found part of the camp's legacy, 368,820 men's suits, 836,255 women's coats and dresses, 5,525 pairs of women's shoes, 13,964 carpets, large quantities of children's clothes, toothbrushes, false teeth, pots and pans. In abandoned railway cars, hundreds of thousands of additional items of apparel were discovered. And in the tannery, the Soviet Investigation Commission found seven tons of hair. More than 7,000 inmates still alive, greeted their liberators, while hundreds lay dead where they had dropped. At the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum website, we see a Soviet-made movie showing the hair. There's the pile of hair. Before killing women, the Nazis cut off their hair. Masses of hair were packed in Let's watch it again, but watch this guy and how he has to go over the top to show that this is human hair. Before killing women, the Nazis cut off their hair. Masses of hair were packed in bags. 20 kilos, 22 kilos, raw material for German factories. The film later shows that the SS left a giant pile of glasses as well. Here is one containing spectacles. Even if every tenth inmate wore spectacles, then how many had to be killed to provide this? And the SS forgot to get rid of the children's clothing. Who in Germany was to wear the clothes of the murdered infants? This mass of clothing this little frock. 514,843 pieces of men's, women's, and children's clothing. 
But don't forget the other Soviet film we saw, shown at the Eichmann trial, that showed they also left a bucket of human heads. These camps were similar in many ways, but the contrast between what the Soviets claimed to have found at Treblinka and what they claimed to have found at Auschwitz brings up an interesting question. Why would the Nazis go to such trouble and labor to cover up the evidence at Treblinka and then leave such incriminating evidence at Auschwitz? Well, maybe Auschwitz was evacuated in an emergency and they didn't have time to destroy the evidence. Except starting on page 980, Raoul Hilberg goes into three pages of detail describing how Auschwitz was not evacuated in an emergency. The highlighted parts of this paragraph state that Heinrich Himmler ordered the dismantling of the killing installations on November 25, 1944. Then we read on page 982. On the evening of January 17th, the last roll call was taken. That means the alleged killing operations had been finished for nearly two months. They had even cleaned out the ovens and chimneys. Predictably, the account of cleaning out the ovens is over the top. A young woman recalled that while cleaning the ovens, she got bones and ashes in her hair, her mouth, and her nostrils. Well, maybe Auschwitz wasn't secret. Except, here's an excerpt from Mr. Death, DVD, Chapter 12, where Dutch Jewish professor Robert Van Pelt talks about how secret the killing at Auschwitz was. There was a code. Germans had a coded language. You never talk about extermination. You always talk about special action or special treatment. There was a very clear policy. Words like gas chamber would not be used. The letter of Bischoff of the 29th of of January is a kind of exception in this because it is a letter which is written by a person who, who manages the whole operation and who himself had established a policy that you would never use the word gas chamber. Somebody in the architecture office underlined the word Vergasungskeller, literally gassing basement, and put on top a note, SS Untersturmführer, Kirschneck exclamation mark. This means Kirchner should be informed about this slip. And it doesn't occur after that. But if they were that careful about printed text, it doesn't make sense that they'd be that careless about leaving piles of incriminating evidence everywhere. Take the seven tons of human hair. That is the one thing on a body that would burn. Several inmates and a large bonfire could have got rid of that in the space of an afternoon. To summarize, you might believe the standard Treblinka story, or you might believe the standard Auschwitz story, or you might believe neither, but how could you believe in both? To believe in both means you believe that at Treblinka they dug up decaying corpses of close to the population equivalent of San Francisco. They cremated all the bodies on outdoor fires. They crushed the tens of millions of bones by taking each bone individually and whacking it several times with a hammer. They destroyed evidence that the camp even existed by dismantling it. But at Auschwitz, they carelessly left a giant pile of human hair, lots of children's clothes, a giant pile of glasses, and 7,000 eyewitnesses waiting to speak with the Soviets. In Raoul Hilberg's book, The Destruction of the European Jews, page 979, we find what happened to the camps when the alleged killing operations were finished. In the general government, the Boog camps, Treblinka, Sobibor, and Belzec were evacuated in the fall of 1943. The Wert Commando, which had constructed these camps, was ordered to destroy them without leaving a trace. At Treblinka, a farm was built, and a Ukrainian was invited to run it for income. And in Yitzhak Arad's book on page 370, we see, the SS authorities planned to leave absolutely no trace of the death camps. All construction in the camps was to be destroyed or evacuated. The whole area was to be cleaned of debris, plowed over, and trees were to be sown and planted. Then on page 373 he writes, The deserted fields of Treblinka were plowed, lupin was sown, and pine woods were planted. 
Consider these passages while watching footage of the 1961 Adolf Eichmann trial. Dr. Berman testifies. Adolf Berman visited Treblinka immediately after the war. I saw the sight which I shall never forget, elevated to oblivion, a tremendous area of many kilometers. And all over this area, there were scattered skulls, bones. Tens of thousands. And heaps of shoes, piles of shoes. And among them, Tens of thousands of little shoes of little children. You picked up one pair of shoes with and your I hand. brought with you. I brought uh, a pair of shoes of children. A pair of shoes you kept until this day, picked up on the fields of Treblinka. I brought it as a very precious thing because I knew that over a million of such little shoes scattered in all the fields of death could be found easily. Thank you, Dr. Berman. The documents, the eyewitness testimonies, Seldom in history has a courtroom heard such a recitation of human cruelty. The person chosen for prosecuting attorney, Gideon Hausner, shown here, would have been the best attorney Israel had to offer. Hausner's qualifications would have also included an impressive knowledge of Holocaust history. But he put Dr. Berman on the stand, and Berman's testimony doesn't fit with the Treblinka story at all. His testimony has a lot of psychological power, though. We use a search engine to find the trial transcript and read when Berman first took the witness stand. Gideon Hausner is the Attorney General. Attorney General, I call Dr. Adolf Berman. The witness wishes to make an affirmation. Presiding Judge, what is your full name? Witness, Adolf Abraham Berman. Doctor? Yes. You are a doctor of psychology? Yes. Before the Second World War, you were the director of the head office of the Jewish Psychological and Psychotechnical Institutions in Poland, Sentos? Yes. It appears Dr. Berman invented a story he knew would make a big psychological impression. Let's look at part of the footage again. Keep in mind that there are two translators' voices. One is Berman's and the other one is Hausner's. And heaps of shoes, piles of shoes, and among them, tens of thousands of little shoes of little children. You picked up one pair of shoes with and you I brought with you. I brought uh, a pair of shoes of children. A pair of shoes you kept until this day, picked up on the fields of Treblinka. I brought it as a very precious thing because I knew that over a million of such little shoes scattered in all the fields of death could be found easily. Thank you, Dr. Berman. We're going to cremate a leg of lamb at the beach as a way to better understand the outdoor cremation process. Along the way, we'll look at Hindu funeral pyres and other topics. We start out with 45 pounds of wood, three of these, and a 12 and a half pound leg of lamb. The wood is around three times the weight of the lamb. Arad writes on page 174 that the concrete pillars that held up the grill were 70 centimeters high. Ours is 39 centimeters, around half. But we're trying to cremate a 12 and a half pound leg of lamb whereas they claim to have stacked bodies two meters high, around six and a half feet. They poured an inflammable liquid over the bodies to help them burn, and we poured gasoline, which has been placed in a water bottle. But with the slightest amount of wind, all your heat leaves out the side of the fire. I'd say that less than 10% of the heat is making it to the lamb. 
The spring winds brought with them the smell of burning bodies from the nearby extermination camp, located 1.86 miles away. So they had wind just like we have a little wind. The fire's been burning for 17 minutes and I've been adding my excess wood. This is the 24 minute mark. I've added all the wood now. Notice the lamb, which I put fat side down, is slightly combusting right there, but not very much. For that to happen, you need a high heat environment, which is why it doesn't make sense to let all the heat leave with the wind. Here's the 30 minute mark. Notice the level of wood is going down, creating a space between the wood and the lamb. The loss of heat from that is removing the conditions where the lamb was able to combust on its own. Here's the 38 minute mark. And this is one hour. What you're looking at is the reason a Hindu funeral pyre works and this doesn't. The airspace between the lamb and wood is so great that the lamb is actually cooling. A Hindu funeral pyre doesn't have a grate. The body rests on the wood. As the wood sinks, so does the body, the body staying close to the heat. Those coals are giving off a lot of heat, but it's dissipating into the outside air. The Germans wouldn't have done it this way, but if they had done it this way, they would have at least implemented the medieval technology of an adjustable height grill. Look at how easy it is according to the story. The body burning went on day and night. The corpses were transferred and arranged on the roasters during the day. At nightfall they were lit and they burned throughout the night. When the fire went out, there were only skeletons or scattered bones on the roasters and piles of ash underneath. We cut into the top of the lamb. It's still raw. This is one hour and 45 minutes after the fire started. The bottom of the lamb is just charred on the outside. We come back five hours later, just after the sun has gone down, this time with 90 more pounds of wood. So our total amount of wood is 135 pounds to cremate a 12 and a half pound leg of lamb. There's less wind and I build a bigger sized fire. It works this time, but I'm cheating because I add this much wood after the fire starts. I keep adding wood to keep the fire level close to the grill. I'm tending the fire, but the eyewitnesses in Arad and Hilberg never mention anyone tending the fire because they're going with the premise that the bodies themselves burn like wood. And the lamb here is burning, but with small flames. And were you to take the wood away, the lamb would stop burning. According to the supposed eyewitnesses, you just light the fire and the fire takes care of itself after that. On page 111 in Yitzhak Arad's book, there is a list of occupations in the death part of the camp, ranging from people who pulled gold teeth out of the mouths of the dead, to gas chamber and tube cleaners, to kitchen and service workers, but they don't mention anyone who hauled wood or tended the fire. And on the maps of Treblinka, Sobibor, and Belzec, there isn't even a warehouse for storing wood. We see minutia of detail on these maps. Number 21, as an example, is the latrine. And on the Sobibor map, number 39, is the SS ironing room. Minutia of detail, but nowhere on any of these maps is there a warehouse for all the wood. Matter of fact, there isn't even a wood shed for the B as in Bruce half billion pounds of wood. That is 30 million packs of Montana hot wood. Well, maybe these are maps of the camps before the cremation operations began. Except all the maps include grills. We continue cremating the leg of lamb, and we're doing this to get an insight into cremating people. This will be repulsive to some, but sometimes you have to look at things that are unsettling in order to quit believing a lie. After two hours of night burning, we're finished.
Here's the cremated leg of lamb the next day. The grill has been warped from the heat. It's bent, and it's made for heat, just not that much heat. Had the Germans built a grill for mass cremations, they would have used specially built alloy beams made to hold up a lot of weight in high heat conditions. Instead, we are told in Arad's book on page 171 that the grill at Sobibor was made from old railway tracks. During World War II, the United States developed the atomic bomb through a program called the Manhattan Project in New Mexico. Similar to Treblinka, Belzec, and Sobibor, the Manhattan Project was a high-priority, top-secret government project researching the mass destruction of human beings. But can you imagine the Manhattan Project using old railroad track rails for their atomic research? Or keeping the Manhattan Project top secret by surrounding it with a tree branch fence? And we're about to see more makeshift, shoddy workmanship methods as we read about what they did with the burnt remains. Here's page 176 in Arad. When the fire went out, there were only skeletons or scattered bones on the roasters and piles of ash underneath. Another special prisoner team known as the Ash Group, Ash Cologne, had the task of collecting the ash and removing the remains of the charred bones from the grill and placing them on tin sheets. Round wooden sticks were then used to break the bones into small fragments. So I'm going to try and do that. I use a five foot long four by four, that is four inches by four inches, and an aluminum sheet. I find the bones friable. Friable means easily crumbled. Except, what is this? It's a sizable piece of meat that didn't turn to ash. I burned 135 pounds of wood under a 12 and a half pound leg of lamb sitting on a grill by itself and I get a large piece of meat that didn't turn to ash. Whereas they say, when the fire went out, there were only skeletons or scattered bones on the roasters and piles of ash underneath. Hmm. And imagine how less cooked it would be if it had been surrounded by other pieces of meat insulating it. Crushing the burnt bodies is a big task. For the three camps, it is 1.5 million people. That's twice the population of San Francisco. But the storytellers took it a meticulous step further. The crushed bodies were then run through a tightly woven screen made of metal wire. Those bone fragments which did not pass through the screen were returned for further smashing. Here's a metal wire screen and it would be tough to even pass the lamb remains through it. But this doesn't fit the story because it is a loosely woven screen and theirs was a tightly woven screen. A crushing operation like this would take some space since neither Arad nor Hilberg describes how it works. Follow me as I put forth a guess on a Southern California football field. The burnt remains of 1,600 people are put in a large pile here in this black circle, and around that, eight stations with two workers per station pull burnt bodies off the pile, crush them on tin sheets, and then sift the crushed remains through a screen. Let's say each station can crush and sift one body every three minutes, which is 20 an hour and 200 per day. So in 10 hours, the eight stations would be finished with the 1,600 bodies. But for Treblinka, for instance, they allegedly crushed and sifted 750,000 bodies in five months. So you would need three of these piles and 24 stations. You are then taking up most of a football field. 
pause and look at the math if interested. So how much space is given for this on Arad's map of Treblinka on page 39? No space at all. Here's the death part of the camp. Here's the new gas chamber, old gas chamber, burial pits, grills, and barracks area. Where did they crush and sift the burnt remains of the population equivalent to San Francisco? It could possibly be over here, east of the gas chambers, when some of the area was still covered. Except then we read on page 175. Other efficiency measures introduced included increasing the number of cremation sites to six, thus enabling the workers to burn up to 12,000 corpses simultaneously and placing the cremating roasters near the mass graves to save time in transferring the bodies. The roasters occupied a good portion of the area east of the gas chambers, which was clear of mass graves and buildings. So I guess they're not there. Arad's maps of Sobibor and Belzec don't include a place either. Neither does any map or model I've ever seen. The falsehood of this whole story comes out when you look on the maps which might be why Raoul Hilberg's three-volume Destruction of the European Jews, the 1985 revised and definitive edition, does not include a single map of any camp. And with the thoroughness that can come with three volumes and 1,274 pages, how much space does Hilberg give to the crushing of millions of burnt bodies? One paragraph. On page 977, Consider our comparison with the Manhattan Project as we read that the Germans looked for a bone crusher, whether manually operated or motor driven, in of all places, the Jewish ghetto. The big conclusion? The ghetto apparently had no such machine. No matter, because apparently the commander of Auschwitz preferred to destroy his bone material with hammers. Lastly, Consider this about the tin sheets, which, by the way, were likely thicker than what's shown here. Consider that upwards of 20 people pounding on metal sheets is going to make some noise. Yet no eyewitness I ever read mentions incessant pounding. And why is a tin sheet in the story to begin with? It's the storyteller's solution for creating a hard surface on bare earth. The storytellers didn't always think of the best solution for things. According to eyewitness accounts at Treblinka, inmates used tree branches as kindling to light the cremation fires. That makes sense, as dry tree branches are very flammable. Perhaps it's the oil in the needles. Here are two small branches, about the size of my hand, from my Christmas tree. It's January 2006, and my tree was in my house a little less than a month. It was sitting in a stand of water to keep it from drying out so quick. Watch how flammable it is. So it makes sense that they would use branches to start the cremation fires. But what doesn't make sense is that the fence surrounding these fires would be made out of tree branches as well. On page 40 we read about this inner fence around the camp perimeter. The inner fence was 3 to 4 meters high and intertwined with tree branches that hid the camp from outside view. That's around 10 to 13 feet high. Here's a map of Treblinka on page 39 in Yitzhak Arad's book. The red part is where there is a fence made out of barbed wire and tree branches so thick you couldn't see through it. Here, according to the story, they burned around 225 million pounds of wood in an area enclosed by a tree branch fence. Notice this point right here. 
The cremation grill is around 14 feet from the tree branch fence. We can tell this from the bedroom sized gas chambers to the left. The distance between the end of the grill and the tree branch fence is about the same distance as it would take to walk across a bedroom floor. Yet no one ever lit the fence on fire, which would have quickly engulfed the tube. On this part, known as the tube, we read on page 42 in Arad, it was fenced on both sides with barbed wire two meters high and intertwined with tree branches so that it was impossible to see in or out. That's six and a half feet high. The inmates in this part of the camp were supposedly forced to help in either the gassing of their fellow Jews or in digging up their decaying bodies and then burning them. Yet we're supposed to believe that not one inmate out of rage, anger, and despair ever simply lit the fence on fire. Doing so would have caused great damage to the camp due to how quickly the fire would have spread along the fence. It also would have been hard to extinguish since there was no pressurized water at the camp. Only well water from three wells. Yet no one ever lit the fence on fire. Would any group of men watch their people be led into gas chambers when they could have so easily destroyed a big portion of the camp by simply throwing a half-burned wood log into the fence? They could have done that just after a transport of 2,000 Jews had arrived in the courtyard, but before they had gone through the tube. At that moment, they could have turned the tube into a giant inferno while burning up much, or perhaps all, of the perimeter fence. A group of men in any culture simply would not have been this acquiescent in face of what was happening. Yankel Wiernik writes about the extra privileges of those that worked in the gassing and cremation part of the camp in his book, A Year in Treblinka, page 34. We, for example, were permitted to smoke while working and even received cigarette rations. Hmm. So they had cigarettes and hence matches. Here's the barracks where they slept, and in their backyard, a 13-foot high tree branch fence going around the perimeter of the camp that, if ever lit, would have quickly engulfed this watchtower above it, and probably within minutes would have spread so fast as to engulf these watchtowers too, while destroying the fence that was keeping them in. Yet, according to the story, no one ever lit it on fire. Here's a couple burning their Christmas tree at the beach in mid-January. The amount of branches here would be nothing compared to a 13-foot high tree branch fence. And within seconds it's already dying down, so that had the inmates ever lit the fence on fire, it would have quickly subsided so that they could have escaped through it. Well, before you talked about wind and rain, how can you now talk about dry tree branches? Because I'm talking about Treblinka now, before I was talking about Sobibor and Belzec. We see on page 170 in Arad, the cremation of the corpses in the camps of Sobibor and Belzec began in the autumn of 1942 and in Treblinka in March 1943. And on page 177, referring to Treblinka, Arad writes, In this camp, the entire cremation operation lasted about four months, from April to the end of July 1943. So the tree branch fence in this area is drying in the hot summer sun during June and July, compounded with the heat from the cremation fires. To summarize, that the Germans would have had a tree branch fence in the first place is so primitive it's absurd, but even more absurd to allege that they wouldn't have changed the fence to a non-flammable one when they began a huge outdoor cremation operation which involved the burning of around a quarter of a billion pounds of wood. It's also not believable that the Jewish inmates wouldn't have ever set the fence on fire. Plus, when you're burning such a huge amount of wood, 1.8 million pounds a day on average, it's not a good idea to have something as flammable as a tree branch fence in the near vicinity. These are issues the people who fabricated the story just didn't think of. On Yitzhak Arad's map of Treblinka, there is an outer fence made out of anti-tank obstacles. We read about it on page 40. A second fence, some 40 to 50 meters from the first, 
included chains of anti-tank obstacles, Spanish horses, wrapped in barbed wire. But if a Soviet tank ever came up to this fence, the tank would already be at point-blank range to obliterate everything in the camp with its large gun in the front. It wouldn't need to enter the camp. Plus, if Soviet tanks ever got this close, the camp would have already been evacuated. In contrast to this, let's look for a moment at how the Germans really did use anti-tank obstacles. There's a website called Lone Sentry that has made a wartime publication accessible on the web called the Intelligence Bulletin. Printed by the Military Intelligence Service throughout World War II, the Intelligence Bulletin was designed to inform officers and enlisted men of the latest enemy tactics and weapons. For the historian and collector, the bulletins offer a rare view into the Allied knowledge of the Axis forces. Going to the September 1943 issue to an article called Types of Concrete Anti-Tank Obstacles. We scroll down and read. In coastal towns, the Germans often used straight or curved steel rails embedded in concrete to block ramps, promenades, streets, and all other exits leading from beaches. Sometimes three or four lengths of straight rail are combined to form a skeleton pyramid, with their bases embedded in concrete and the tops bolted together. Rail and concrete obstacles are generally from three and a half to four and a half feet high. Here's a picture of this type of anti-tank obstacle taken by photographer Robert Kappa, used in this case to make it difficult for troop transport boats to land. The Germans used anti-tank obstacles in ways that made sense. Using them for a perimeter fence doesn't make sense. A similar absurdity of the storytellers is found on the Belzic map on page 437 Number 19, standing all by itself, is an anti-tank trench used as a burial pit. So how does that make sense? Prior to being used as a burial pit, it was there to keep a tank going from here to here? Back to the Treblinka map, let's examine the likelihood that anti-tank obstacles strung with barbed wire had nothing to do with tanks, but rather were the best way to keep people inside the camp. But consider that too many things are doubling for other things in the Treblinka story. A captured Soviet tank motor doubles as a death gas generator. On the cremation grill, railroad rails double as heat-resistant alloy beams. And now anti-tank obstacles double as a death camp fence. If this camp had really existed as a death camp, would it have been this ramshackle and rigged up? We really need to know more about these World War II anti-tank obstacles known as Spanish horses. So we do a Google search, and something very odd comes up. All our hits are references to Treblinka. Surely these Spanish horses were used in other places during the war. We go to the San Francisco Public Library and use their big multi-volume dictionary, though it looks like an encyclopedia. It's a dictionary and look up Spanish horse. It's not there. We then consult a military dictionary, and it doesn't mention Spanish horses either. We do find that a certain type of anti-tank obstacle is known as a Czech hedgehog, the kind we saw in the Kappa photo. So it begins to look like somewhere a long time ago an alleged Treblinka eyewitness couldn't remember the name Czech hedgehog, and as happens with memory, came up with the term Spanish horse instead. That might be why a Google search on this returns 25 hits, while a search on anti-tank and Czech hedgehog returns 8,900 hits. But what's in a name anyway? The main point is that stringing barbed wire from a contraption like this when tanks were not a factor would have been ridiculous. We go back to the September 1943 issue of the Intelligence Bulletin to another article called Barbed Wire Obstacles, German, and see a gnarly barbed wire obstacle 33 feet deep. And this is just a battlefield obstacle. Surely they'd put more energy into a death camp fence. Then we go to a March 1944 article called More German Obstacles. We find this issue at the University of California, Berkeley. 
Here's barbed wire suspended from metal stakes pounded into the ground. No need to drag in a heavy anti-tank obstacle to do the same thing a metal stake will do. And look, they've managed to build a fence out of something other than tree branches. Here is a book about the Holocaust called Voices and Views, edited by Deborah Dwork. This book is a compilation of passages that Dwork has selected from other Holocaust books. For instance, here's part of Raoul Hilberg's book, and here's part of a book by Yitzhak Arad. We go to Saul Friedlander's entry. He wrote a book that included an excerpt of a prison confession of SS officer Kurt Gerstein who allegedly visited Treblinka and Belzec. On page 391, we read in the confession where it says that at Treblinka, Gerstein saw veritable mountains of clothing and underwear 115 to 130 feet high. Wow, that's a lot of clothes. But let's think about that for a moment. Suppose you're putting clothing in a pile and you pile them as high as you can reach on the tip of your toes. That's around eight feet. Then after that, you can maybe wad pieces of clothing into a ball and throw them into the air to get a dome-shaped pile, maybe 25 feet high. But the pile Gerstein mentions is 130 feet high. See the people walking on the sidewalk? 130 feet high is as high as this building. Why did Kurt Gerstein mention something so absurd as a pile of clothes that high? And why is it in Deborah Dwork's book? A look at the bigger picture might explain why. First, who was Kurt Gerstein? Gerstein was a mining engineer. Some years after getting his engineering degree, he went to medical school for two years as well. After that, he became an officer and a disinfection specialist in the SS. That's the elite Nazi forces. It's alleged that he visited Treblinka and Belzec and while at Belzec, he witnessed a gassing there. At the end of the war, he was arrested by the French and sent to a prison in Paris. In prison, he wrote an account of the gassing he allegedly saw. It is known today as the Gerstein Report. Gerstein's report is important because it is essential for the validity of the Belzec story. Here's why. The Belzec camp has 600,000 deaths attributed to it. A significant portion of the whole Holocaust. But the eyewitness evidence falls largely on only three people. We have the highest ranking alleged camp official who survived the war, Joseph Oberhauser, the only Jewish inmate who survived the war, Rudolf Reeder, and a specialist who allegedly visited the camp, Kurt Gerstein. We've already covered these two. Reeder was the 61 year old man who escaped during an errand when a guard fell asleep. And Joseph Oberhauser was the man Claude Landsman confronted at his workplace. But Oberhauser wouldn't be in the picture until 1960. So right after the war, we have just two main witnesses, Kurt Gerstein and Rudolf Reeder. There's a problem with Rudolf Reeder's story, though. As the only Jewish survivor out of 600,000 people, he told authorities that the method of execution was not engine exhaust. In Carlo Matono's book, we read what readers said. The air in the chambers, when they were opened, was pure, transparent, and odorless. In particular, there was no smoke from the exhaust gas of the engine. The exhaust gas was evacuated from the engine directly into the open air, and not into the chambers. That was page 38. Then remember that at Nuremberg, it was also said that engine exhaust was not the method of execution. The Soviet prosecutor said an electric floor caused the deaths. The electric floor story worked great as anti-German propaganda, but it weakened the larger Holocaust story because it's untenable that Auschwitz, Treblinka, and Belzec would use three diabolically different methods of execution. So an eyewitness is needed to say they executed people at Treblinka and Belzec at least in the same way. Enter Kurt Gerstein. Without him, there was a big question mark as to how 600,000 people died. And his account was needed to make Belzec fit into the larger Holocaust story. Gerstein's report contained lots of talk of engine exhaust being piped into the Belzec chambers. 
But Kurt Gersting wasn't completely willing to play ball with the prison interrogators. One can speculate that he wanted to make a statement that would make the torture slash interrogation stop, and a statement that would help him not get sentenced to death. But he also didn't want to be used as a stooge in what he knew was a giant lie. So what did Gersting do? He used an aspect of his own German culture, precision, to sabotage his report, but at the same time fool the interrogators. That would explain the 130-foot pile of clothing. But he discredited his story with way more than that. For instance, how many people does he say died at Belzic and Treblinka? 25 million. Which Deborah Dork publishes without comment on page 390. Is precision part of German culture? This disc might help show that it is. I picked it up while on vacation in Germany at a mineral water health spa. And like many glasses in Germany, it's marked on the side so you know exactly how much you're drinking. 100 milliliters, 50 milliliters. In this object, we see aspects of German culture, smart design, and precision. Gerstein writes that when he witnessed a gassing at Belzec, the diesel engine wouldn't start. That sets him up to then insert a lot of impossibilities into his story. Let's read the passage. It was two hours and 49 minutes, all recorded by stopwatch, before the diesel started. Right up to that moment, the people had been shut up alive in those four crowded chambers, four times 750 persons in four times 1,590 cubic feet of space. Another 25 minutes dragged by. Many of those inside were already dead. They could be seen through the small window when an electric lamp inside went on for a few moments and lit up the chamber. After 28 minutes, few were left alive. Finally, at the end of 32 minutes, all were dead. First of all, Gersting was a mining engineer. Miners operate engines underground. Gersting would have known that diesel exhaust is far less dangerous than regular gasoline engine exhaust. The Germans wouldn't have used diesel. Second, 750 people can't fit in a room that size. Let's do the math. 1,590 cubic feet divided by 750 people is 2.12 cubic feet per person. That is the space of these two boxes on the left. And how big of a room is this? 1,590 cubic feet is the size of a large living room, 16 and a half feet long and 16 and a half feet wide, which is five meters by five meters, with a ceiling that many could touch with the tops of their heads, five feet 10 inches high. And in that space, it would be almost three people per square foot. So the chest and shoulders area of nearly three people would have to roughly fit into this much space. This tile is 11 and a half by 11 and a half inches. Thirdly, if you packed that many people into a low ceiling room, you would be displacing much of the air in that room with bodies, similar to how when you get into a bathtub that's filled to the brim, the water will then spill over the side. 750 people can't all then breathe that small amount of air left in the room for two hours and 49 minutes. Gerstein wants us to know he's not exaggerating, all recorded by stopwatch. We find an alternate translation of this sentence in Yitzhak Arad's book on page 102 to be sure of the meaning here. After two hours and 49 minutes, the stopwatch recorded it all. The diesel started. Up to that moment, the people shut up in those four crowded chambers were still alive. We go back to the Gerstein translation in Dork's book for number four. Gerstein says that some were alive after being in the chamber for three hours and 14 minutes. 
Humans convert oxygen to carbon dioxide when they breathe. So 750 people would have created a high carbon dioxide, low oxygen environment in the chamber. So we have 2 hours and 49 minutes of that. Then diesel exhaust pours in for 25 minutes. And Gerstein's commentary at this point? Many were already dead. Which means that some were still alive. Which Gerstein knows is absurd. Number 5. There was a window in the gas chamber door. Gerstein mentions that the person who accompanied him to Belzec, Professor Fannenstiel, had his eyes glued to a window in the wooden door. And we read later that Gerstein could see the people inside through the small window when an electric lamp inside went on for a few moments and lit up the chamber. But how high is that window in the wooden door? If the ceiling is around 5 feet 10 inches, the window in the door has to be lower than that. Bodies would be pressed up against it, blocking any view. One can see this when he describes the dead victims later in this report. Inside, the people were still standing erect, like pillars of basalt, since there had not been an inch of space for them to fall in or even lean. So that's more evidence that the bodies would have been blocking the window, and even without that, the water vapor in the chamber would have condensed on the glass, fogging it up. Gerstein purposely discredited his report with way more than what we've just looked at, but we need to move on. A few last comments on Kurt Gerstein. Someone probably finally figured out what Gerstein was doing. He died in a French prison just weeks after his final report, likely when the interrogators clued in that they'd been fooled. The cause given was suicide. What Gerstein did with precision has a parallel to what Eastern European Yiddish did with psychological and emotional content. Both used an aspect of their culture in their Holocaust stories. With the Yiddish stories, the emotional content often mistakenly didn't work with logistics. In contrast, Gerstein used precision to purposely not work with logistics. Gerstein is a hero in that he did what he could to show that a giant lie was being put on his people. Holocaust historians use Gerstein as a valid source. Deborah Dwork, for instance, doesn't comment on any of the discrepancies I've just pointed out. For the Gerstein passage in her book, she has just two comments. She'd like us to know that Christian Weert was the commandant of Belzec, Sobibor, and Treblinka, and that Judaism requires that a dead body be cleansed before burial. And Yitzhak Arad, the former director of Israel's Holocaust Museum, has a chapter devoted to Gerstein. He writes on page 102, The report of what Gerstein saw as an eyewitness is reliable. The facts based on what his host told him were to some extent exaggerated by them or simple boasting. Ah, glad he cleared that up for us. And here's Raoul Hilberg using the Gerstein report as a source. Gerstein was a disinfection specialist. The disinfectant he used was Zyklon B. When he heard that they were saying Zyklon B was used to kill 3 million people at Auschwitz, he likely figured he had a better chance to work within the story as opposed to denying the story, which would have been a fast track to a death sentence. Thus he postures himself as a valuable witness, someone on the inside who is against the genocide. This can be seen in the following passage, where he shows that Germans can also use emotional and psychological story content. Upon supposedly watching the Jews go into the gas chambers, Gerstein writes, I prayed with them. I pressed myself into a corner and cried out to my God and theirs. How glad I should have been to go into the gas chambers with them. How gladly I should have died the same death as theirs. Then an SS officer in uniform would have been found in the gas chambers. People would have believed it was an accident, and the story would have been buried and forgotten. But I could not do this yet. I felt I must not succumb to the temptation to die with these people. I now knew a great deal about these murders. Weert had told me, there are not ten people alive who have seen or will see as much as you. When the whole thing was over, all the foreign auxiliaries would be executed. 
I was one of the handful of people who had seen every corner of the establishment and certainly the only one to have visited it as an enemy of this gang of murderers. Now we turn to Treblinka guard Franz Souchomel, seen in Claude Landsman's movie Shoah. He sabotaged his account, not with precision, but with an absurd story. The women in the sleep, they must wait. They heard the motor in the gas camera. When they were there, they were in the Todesangst. Und in der Todesangst gibt der Mensch her. Nicht mal da entleert er sich. Entweder vorne oder hinten. Und so war das möglich, dass, wie die Frauen standen, nicht wahr, fünf oder sechs Reihen Experimente waren. Aufgestanden. Nein, no, nein, no, die konnten sich schon bitten auch, gell? oder auch stehen. Also ich habe nicht zugeschaut. Ich weiß nur von Code. Defecation when scared does happen, but it wouldn't happen en masse like that. Five or six rows of excrement is absurd. The background of this clip is this. In the 1970s, Claude Landsman paid Souchomel around $1,800 to do this interview, a lot of money in the 1970s, particularly for Souchomel due to years of lost wages after getting sentenced in 1965 to seven years in jail for being at Treblinka. Souchomel likely could use the money, but doesn't want to be used as a stooge for the larger lie, and thus sabotages his account with his defecation story. Landsman secretly videotapes Souchomel during the interview, which is why the image is so bad. Though it appears that Souchomel knows he's being filmed, since when this line isn't covering his eyes, he seems to glance at the camera. Like Gerstein, Souchomel works within the story. That might have made the difference between life in prison and the seven years in prison that he got. Revisionist scholar Robert Forisson points out how this has a parallel with witch trials. Forisson said, When the people were accused of having met the devil, they wouldn't say, Your Honor, the best proof that I have not met the devil is that the devil does not exist. It would have been the end. No, the tactic was to say, Oh yes, the devil was there on top of the hill. Myself, I was down at the bottom. Accused witches in the 1500s also worked within the story. Souchomel gets away with his story by presenting it as a phenomenon that medical science knows about. Watch this. Aus Todesangst. Aus Todesangst. Lässt man. Das ist ein altes. Wenn der Mensch Angst ist und weiß, dass er sterben muss, auch im Bett kann es passieren, nicht wahr? Meine Mutter kniete vor dem Bett. Meine Mutter war ein großer Haufen da. Ja. Das ist so. Das ist ärztlich das ist festge ja. festgestellt. We just saw an absurd story presented as phenomenon. Watch how Adolf Eichmann does the same thing. I've added the yellow subtitles. Remember that on this occasion I passed through Lambda, which is outside the boundaries of the right, and then I saw for the first time uh, the so-called blood fountain. It's an absurd story presented as a phenomenon. Souchamel did the same thing. In Eichmann's case, likely to minimize the torture in jail, but at the same time to subtly resist being used as a stooge in the giant lie. Problems with Eichmann's story. Why wouldn't the blood just coagulate in the dirt? 
And if there were gases produced near or below the blood, why wouldn't the gas just bubble up through the blood to the top, instead of pressurizing the blood? And if we look at the transcript found on the web, we see that Eichmann happened to notice the fountain of blood on the side of a road while passing through a town. On the front page of the New York Times the next day, there was an article which mentioned Eichmann seeing the fountain of blood. Down here we see murmurs of disbelief, but that's not regarding the fountain of blood. Murmurs of disbelief and a derisive whistle were heard from the public gallery when Eichmann, talking rapidly, declared his abhorrence of genocide. Eichmann is sitting in a glass box with execution inevitable, likely being tortured, having no country or group advocating for him, probably not a single person who will publicly say they are a friend of his, and yet with all this, he figures out a way to get his message out to the world that this is a giant lie. He does it by telling absurd stories within the lie. Here's another. Here's some problems with the story. Number one, you don't need an engine to make carbon monoxide. Engines are not the best way to make carbon monoxide. They just seem like the best way if you're not a chemist. In an earlier chapter, we showed that making carbon monoxide gas is a fairly simple process called gasification. Here, some people have made a gasifier out of things like an old water heater. This brings us to number two. A submarine engine is too big and too complicated. For comparison, we go to the USS Pampanito in San Francisco, built in 1943. On both sides of this picture is a submarine engine, but you are only seeing half of each engine because half is below the floor level. Operating this diesel engine takes a group of mechanics who have been to school so that they know what all these dials are for. Here's the exhaust outlet, around 14 inches in diameter. It could put out lots of exhaust, but diesel exhaust has a low carbon monoxide concentration. A river of exhaust through a farmer's hovel is not going to change that, which is why, believe it or not, this would work better. Number three, Lublin is around 250 miles from the sea. I 
We look in a random McNally atlas, page 36. Here's Lublin. We look at the distance key and see that Lublin is around 250 miles from the sea. That's a long way to lug a Russian submarine engine to attach to a hovel. Number four, the Germans didn't capture any Soviet submarines. Submarines are rarely captured because they usually sink when hit. The website uboat.net has an article called Captured U-Boats. The author states, the Germans captured one enemy submarine during World War II at sea, the British HMS SEAL. Number five, Farmer's Hovel is too small time for a government operation. Where I saw two farmer's hovels that he was assigned to turn these two hovels into hermetic and sealed buildings. Hovel in my Oxford Concise English Dictionary is defined as small, miserable dwelling, and another translation of Eichmann's testimony calls them peasants' cottages. Renovating a farmer's hovel is something a retired senior citizen might do in his spare time, not an activity connected with a top-secret government operation. These five items are some of the discrepancies Eichmann was hoping people would notice. Would Ral Hilberg use Eichmann's trial testimony as a source for his book? Yes, a lot, when it fits with the story Hilberg is trying to tell. To summarize, we just saw three Germans who worked within the story but also subtly and purposely sabotaged their accounts. A final thing worth noting is the occupations of the Germans in the camps. Here is a book on Belzec by Robin O'Neill, found on the web. In chapter 14, he gives tables of the people tried in the Sobibor trial and the Treblinka trial. He lists their occupations. Ask yourself if the occupations make more sense for a death camp or for a disinfection camp. Male nurse, male nurse, male nurse. Death camp or disinfection camp? Then we look at the table for the first Treblinka trial. As an aside, Robin O'Neill makes a mistake here, as Joseph Hurtrider was tried and convicted 14 years earlier in what was really the first Treblinka trial. There's Franz Souchomel, by the way. We see male nurse, male nurse, male nurse, male nurse, male nurse. Does that make more sense for a death camp or disinfection camp? Then in Yitzhak Arad's book on page 100, we see the occupation of Kurt Gerstein, chief disinfection officer in the main hygienic office of the Waffen SS, and the man who accompanied him, Wilhelm Fannenstiel. He was a professor and director of the Hygienic Institute at the University of Marburg, Lawn. Does that make more sense for a death camp or disinfection camp? We've seen the destruction of the European Jews by Raoul Hilberg, and we've looked at Belzec, Sobibor, and Treblinka by Yitzhak Arad. The third most important book would be The Death Camp Treblinka, edited by Alexander Donat. Published in 1979, he also wrote another book, Alexander Donat is an alleged camp survivor, and he wrote his own memoir about his experiences in the camps called The Holocaust Kingdom, published in 1963. On the inside cover, we find a map, and we read, The journeys of the author and his wife through four countries and nine death camps. Hmm. Maybe they weren't death camps. Leaving Donat's memoir 
and going back to his book on Treblinka, we look at the table of contents and find that the bulk of the book is made up of six eyewitness accounts, two of whom we're already familiar with, Yankel Wernick and Samuel Rosman. On page 147, we see what Yankel Wernick looks like and find that Donat has reprinted One Year in Treblinka. We've looked at the original 1944 version at the University of California at Berkeley. It's an obvious fraud, but not only does Donat republish it, but he also takes the liberty to change Wernick's words. Let's compare the beginning of chapter 7 in both. In the 1944 original English version we read, it turned out that we were building 10 additional gas chambers, more spacious than the old ones, with a capacity of about 150 square feet. As many as 1,000 to 1,200 persons could be crowded into one gas chamber. Hold this in your memory that here it says 150 square feet. Now we look at Alexander Donat's 1979 version. It turned out that we were building 10 additional gas chambers, more spacious than the old ones, 7 by 7 meters, or around 50 square meters. We break out the calculator. and find that 7 meters is nearly 23 feet, which is 527 square feet. So Donat is taking the liberty to more than triple the square feet of the chamber. Now we go from Yankel Wernick to Samuel Rosman. Let's see what happened to Rosman's story between his article written during the war, found in this congressional publication, and in Donat's book. We compare the first paragraph in Donat with what it says in this congressional publication. On September 17, the owner of the factory in which I worked, W.C. Tobbins, announced that all the workers were to gather in the yard to have their papers checked. He gave us his word of honor that after this inspection we would be sent back to our machines. In the yard, five troopers were waiting for us. They took us to the train. Now we look in Alexander Donat's book. I was taken to Treblinka in 1942. I had been living in Warsaw. They took me out on Yom Kippur. In the middle of praying, they took us away to Treblinka. We had a minion in the courtyard. We were reciting our prayers in the courtyard. There were no more synagogues open by that time. We were working in Tobin's shop, a factory that produced buttons for the Germans. Tobin's had 30 or 40 enterprises working for him in occupied Warsaw. In the shop where I worked, there were 125 to 130 people. They took everybody away. A couple of us they killed right on the spot. The rest were taken to Treblinka. In the later story, Rosman made himself more pious and the Germans more evil. A couple things here. In the footnote, we see that a minion is a quorum of ten adult Jewish males needed for public worship. And we see Yom Kippur. We go to Jewish Virtual Library and see that Yom Kippur is probably the most important holiday of the Jewish year. It later says, Yom Kippur is a complete Sabbath. No work can be performed on that day. By the way, it says up here that Rosman was one of the prime witnesses at the Dusseldorf trials and witness for the prosecution at the Fort Lauderdale trial. A couple people at this trial got life imprisonment, and the guy in this trial, Fedor Fedorenko, was later executed in the Soviet Union. Here's the two accounts side by side if you want to pause and compare. We've already seen this iconoclastic theme of Germans coming and interrupting prayers on Yom Kippur. We saw it in Ben Heck's article in Reader's Digest. Here we see it's Yom Kippur and everyone's praying. And then the Germans came and set fire, machine gunned, and undressed the women and whipped them. 
And Abraham Bamba uses the Yom Kippur date also. The first transport from Chans to Hava was sent away at the day of the Yom Kippur. The day before Sukkot, there was the second transport. I was together with them. In Donat's book, on page 284, there is a chapter on the some 60 people who survived the war to tell the horror story of Treblinka. Donat provides little biographies on most of them. He explains that these bios weren't easy to get. When I approached some of the survivors for authentic details about Treblinka, their reaction was by far not as enthusiastic as I had expected. He later writes, some simply did not answer my inquiries. We might not believe that these people were in a death camp, but we very well can believe that they were indeed Yiddish-speaking people of the Jewish religion who lived in Poland before the war. That we can believe. From this we come to a common question posed to Holocaust deniers. If you say you don't believe in the Holocaust, then what happened to the Jews of Europe? Did they just disappear out of thin air? The answer is that they emigrated. It's really not a preposterous answer if we consider Donat's data. In other words, if we use this group as a random sample of the pre-war Jewish population of Poland, then we see they emigrated. There are millions of European Jews in Israel, not thousands. Had the Holocaust happened, there would have been thousands, not millions like the Samad 60 here who escaped from the second biggest alleged death camp in Europe, Treblinka. They didn't emigrate during the war. They emigrated in the five or so years after the war, for the most part. And we get to Beric Rosman and read, Rosman is the only Treblinka survivor to have remained in Poland. One reason why it's hard to establish an immigration path from Poland to Israel is that the Polish Jews changed their language. Rather than preserving Yiddish, they discarded it and replaced it with Hebrew. One might say, but Yiddish is just a modern version of Hebrew. Yiddish is based on Hebrew. No, it's not. Consider how you say I am in Yiddish, Ich bin. We look up a Yiddish word that we might be familiar with, nash, and we read Yiddish, nash, from nashen, to eat sweets, nibble on, from Middle High German, nashen, to nibble, from Old High German. Then we look up kvetch and find that it comes from Middle High German. The history of a people is embedded in their language, but that's a whole nother topic. Many Polish Jews changed their names as well. Just in the people we've looked at in this video, we find that Rudolf Reeder, Belzec's only alleged Jewish survivor, used to be Roman Robach. The author of this book, Alexander Donat, used to be Mikhail Berg. Yitzhak Arad is another example. Before becoming the director of Israel's Holocaust Museum and author of Belzec Sobibor Treblinka, he was born in Poland and spoke Yiddish. He immigrated to Israel, changed his last name from Rudnitsky to the more Mideast sounding Arad, changed his language from Yiddish to Hebrew, and then with a career in the Israeli military, was involved with waging wars against the 5,000-year-old indigenous population of Egypt during the 1950s and the 1960s. Strange, isn't it? 
We see an article on the Reuters webpage called Germany Headed for Demographic Disaster, and we read, With fewer than 1.4 babies per woman, Germany ranks near the very bottom of the 25-nation European Union, and according to the Berlin Institute, the country now has the lowest birth rate in the world relative to its overall population. Hmm, why is that? Unbelievably, the article focuses on economic implications of all things. Clearly, one of the responses to this is to encourage older people to participate in the workforce longer. Nothing is bigger in the German psyche and identity than the Holocaust. It creates guilt, self-hatred, and demoralization. So, Austin, what do you think of the opening credits? This is the beginning of the third Austin Powers movie, and Spielberg is playing a parody of himself. So, Austin, what do you think of the opening credits? Well, I can't believe Sir Steven Spielberg, the grooviest filmmaker in the history of cinema, is making a movie about my life. Very shagadelic, baby, yeah! <laughs> Contrast the fun and laughs of Hollywood with the idea that when it comes to instilling guilt, self-hatred, and demoralization in the German people, Spielberg's tactic seems to be catch them while they're young. The testimonies also serve as a basis for interactive educational materials and videos. Hitler including a German language CD-ROM, which is being used by one million students in classrooms throughout Germany. We go to the website of Professor Harold Marcuse, a professor of modern German history at the University of California at Santa Barbara, and we click on the courses page. Here he is encouraging teachers to teach the Holocaust, which is his specialty. We go to the lecture notes for a world history lecture, and we see a comic. This is hard to read, but it says, Only by examining that which is behind us can we ever hope to gain insight into that which lies ahead. Great statement. But what happens when what's being taught as history is actually a giant lie? What does that do for someone's ability to navigate their future? Or for a people's ability to navigate their future? Here's a syllabus on his site to a class called The Holocaust in German History. And we bump into Steven Spielberg again because we see that Professor Marcuse had his students watch Schindler's List, and later they watched Escape from Sobibor, that movie we looked at earlier in this video that starred Rutger Hauer as Alexander Paczerski. Action adventure hero Rutger Hauer stars in an incredible true tale of courage and triumph. Those of you who survive, bear witness! Let the world know what has happened here! Escape from Sobibor. You have arrived at Sobibor. There are a lot of parallels between Steven Spielberg and Ben Hecht, and seeing the tombstones paving the road in Schindler's List is a good place to start taking note of that. Raoul Hilberg doesn't mention tombstones paving roads, not that he's honest either. He just knows what's truly outrageous. But Schindler's List is from 1993. To see the future of emotional content, we go to a trailer at the Shoah Foundation. The new target slash victim? Young hip-hop kids. <laughs> didn't care much. I, I guess, I mean, the difference is now that, like, that, like, I grew to accept it.
to ensure that nothing like the Holocaust happens again. We really need to establish a culture of to that's tolerant. Learn from, from your mistakes. Learn from your mistakes. That's the first thing that came to my mind. Mm. Please be more tolerant. Because everything can be solved in time. Teaching tolerance is great, but you could use real examples. You don't have to use a lie example. You don't have to teach a lie example to kids whose own ancestry includes real examples. These kids could be learning about the American Indians. Instead, they're watching a car drive down a tombstone road. Someone might say, well, even if one third of the Holocaust didn't happen, the other two thirds is bad enough for me. I hope no one walks away from this video thinking this. The whole thing is a lie. I just chose one third so I could cover it thoroughly. And even that took four hours and 15 minutes. We started this video with this sketch and from there went in a lot of directions. If we'd continued with this diagram, we would have had various eyewitnesses at the ends of the branches. So in a simplified version, I'll put some in now. We could look at this diagram as showing the foundation of United States foreign policy in the Mideast, and we see there's something rotten in the foundation. Because they needed the woman's hair to be transported to Germany. A big lie in the foundation that leads to unfair U.S. foreign policy in the Mideast. We can put it this way, Bomba down here equals bombs up here.